Eastern and Pacific on our companion network, C-SPAN. Next to hearing on a proposal for a two-year federal budget, the House Rules Committee today met to consider the matter and heard from the heads of the White House and Congressional Budget Offices. The hearing is about two and a half hours. The hearing will come to order. This is the second of three hearings being held by the Rules Committee to examine various proposals for establishing a two-year budget and appropriation cycle. On February 16th, we heard from 16 of our colleagues. It was a long day uh, in the House. We began with the Speaker of the House, uh, Mr. Hastert, and the Chairman and Ranking Minority members of the Appropriations Committee. This morning, we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, hearing the uh, perspectives of the Executive Branch and Congressional Support Agencies. At our final hearing, which is going to be uh, next Thursday, the Committee will receive testimony from our former colleague, Mr. Hamilton, from the uh, former your predecessor, uh, Mr. Liu, Leon Panetta, and our former colleague, uh, members of academia and representatives of uh, budget reform organizations, state legislatures, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Sounds like another lengthy hearing. Uh, the prepared statements of our witnesses, along with the transcripts of the hearings, can be found on the Rules Committee's website at www.house.gov rules. This hearing can also be heard live. Do you want me to do that again for you, Joe? What's that? You want to hear that again, the website again? No, I'll, I'll Okay, okay. Oh, good, good, good. This hearing can also be heard live on the Internet by going to our website. Anyone who follows budget process issues is aware of the fact that at the end of the last session of Congress, a bipartisan group of 245 House members joined in uh, introducing a resolution calling for the enactment of a biennial budget process in the second session of the 106th Congress. As we move forward with this process, our goal is to gather all of the technical expertise possible to develop consensus legislation that will be successful in streamlining the budget process, enhancing programmatic oversight, and strengthening the management of government programs and bureaucracies. As I mentioned at our first hearing on February 16th, we heard from uh, Speaker Hastert, who called on us to work with the House Budget Committee and with the Senate in a bipartisan fashion to produce a biennial budget package for the House to consider this year. Appropriations Committee Chairman Bill Young said this is a good time to look at implementing a biennial budget process, but urged us not to load up any legislation with other controversial budget process proposals. We also heard from a number of opponents of biennial budgeting, such as uh, our colleague David Obey. He raised concerns that biennial budgeting will undermine Congress's constitutional responsibilities, increase the size and number of supplemental appropriations, and lock Congress into policy decisions that will need to be changed as a result of changing circumstances. I happen to believe the case for biennial budgeting is overwhelming. While not a panacea, I believe it will improve government fiscal management, programmatic oversight, budget stability and predictability, and government cost effectiveness. To hear the perspectives of the executive branch and congressional support agencies, I'm pleased to welcome OMB Director Jack Liu, we're going to be hearing from uh, Congressional Budget Office Director Dan Crippen, General Accounting Office Associate Director Sue Irving, and CRS Specialist Lou Fisher. So uh, we're very pleased to welcome you, Mr. Lou. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, your first appearance before the uh, Rules Committee, and it's very rare that uh, we have uh, anyone other than our colleagues testify before the Rules Committee, but we do occasionally have hearings, and the subcommittee holds hearings, so we're Mr. Pleased Chairman. to welcome you here, and uh, I'd like to call on Mr. Moakley. Oh, for thank you. I, I was getting ready to call on you. Oh, I, I, I wasn't know you've, you've overlooked me so many times. It's just oh, I've happen. never overlooked you, Mr. Moakley. It's impossible. Okay, thank you. And so before I call on you, Mr. Liu, I'm going to call on Mr. Moakley, in case you were wondering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I really want to thank you for continuing these hearings on the biennial budgeting. Although I certainly like the idea of spending less time on the budget, I'm skeptical that would actually happen. I believe we could spend a great deal of time in the off year revising the budget resolution and passing more supplementals than we do. But for the sake of argument, let us suppose we'd spend only half as much time on budget-related legislation. Is that really a good thing? It appeals to members because agreeing on a budget and working out the appropriation bills is among the hardest and most contentious work we do each year. 
Each of us has a different set of priorities, which is why agreeing on a budget always involves making very painful choices. The only way these measures get passed at all is by everybody making compromises. In the end, no one is completely satisfied with the fi uh, final result. And it's been that way ever since the first Congress met back in 1789. So it's very tempting to think we might be able to skip a year of making these hard choices. But it is our constitutional responsibility to make these hard choices. We are paid to make decisions about taxing, about spending. And we cannot, at least, we should not delegate our duties in the off year to a control board as Ohio or some other biennial states do. Now, should we expect unelected executive branch bureaucrats to set fiscal policy for the nation every other year, just for the convenience of our avoiding hard work? I've not heard any member actually make the case for a biennial budget based on the possibility of avoiding hard work, but I sincerely believe this is what makes the idea initially appealing. The argument we hear is based on the amount of time devoted to the budget. We're told that the Congress spends so much time on the budget-related measures year after year, it crowds out the opportunity to conduct oversight hearings and enact authorization bills. Mr. Chairman, that absolutely is not true. I asked the Congressional Research Service to determine just what proportion of floor time is devoted to budget relation related legislation. They counted all the hours spent on all the budget resolutions, all the appropriation bills, reconciliation and tax measures, conference reports, and all other related rules and motions. They looked at each session from 1991 through 1998. In most years, five out of the eight, we spent less than one-fifth of our time on budget-related measures. The most contentious year, 1995, the year of the shutdown, we still spent less than one-third of our time on the budget. If four-fifths of the time we are normally in session is not enough time to do other legislation, I think there's something wrong with the process, if not with us. I think the CRS memorandum uh, be placed in the, uh, in the record. I, I have it here, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Chairman, although the idea of biennial budgeting certainly warrants further study, I have to say I don't think it'll turn out to warrant the hoopla. It's Congress's job to come up with the budget, no matter how ugly the process, and delegating that responsibility every other year to federal bureaucrats is not what our constituents had in mind when they sent us here. We have the time to do it. We just lack probably some of the inclination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Without objection, with this article uh, on the record. I want to frame to put on the wall. <laughs> yes, I to put it in the record. place of which portrait? Yeah. <laughs> Solomon. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew that the answer was going to be on that one. Um, and I very much appreciate your encouragement of the work ethic, uh, Mr. Moakley. And uh, I'm happy to call on one of the uh, hardest workers here, Mr. Linder. Mr. Chairman, I'm be here and listen to the testimony. I have no opening statements. I'm anxious to hear the testimony. I would like to respond to one thing that Mr. Moakley said that floor time versus non floor time. Floor time is 25 or 20 percent of what we do, but my guess is the non floor time on the budget takes up four or five times as much as the floor time. The conference reports, the negotiating back and forth with the White House, and to do that every other year would give us an awful lot of time to do oversight, which we seem to be lacking in doing now. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing our witnesses. Thank you, Chairman. I'm delighted to be here today and uh, am very proud of my chairman for bringing forth uh, a full and forthright discussion. I believe that this in-depth discussion about the idea of biennial budgeting is very, very important. And I know my colleague, uh, Mr. Moakley, says that we don't spend too much time on the budget and we uh, it does not consume the time that we've got. And I tend to disagree with that. I think we do spend too much time on the budgeting and too little time on oversight. I've had a number, a great number of dealings with the Inspector General Walker. Uh, we've talked about the duty of oversight and the opportunities that we have to make this government not only work more efficiently, but to uh, provide them with a set of tools that are necessary so that we can uh, make government do the things and ha help it to perform in the ways that it should be done. Uh, but I believe that probably the greatest avenue 
uh, of success that will be uh, come as a result of biennial budgeting will be not just the impact on Congress, but on agencies. Agencies always, um, I think, would tell you that if they get a budget that is early with money that is appropriated to where they know exactly what what uh, Congress is asking them to do, they can not only perform in their planning function properly, but how they play that out. And I remember doing a college paper back in 1977 on the effectiveness of giving the Pentagon uh, a five-year budget. And I am well aware that we're not talking about five-year budgets here, but the of, of how a five-year budget would allow the, what was then the largest department of the uh, government to move efficiently and effectively, not only through their procurement, but also on the things, the day-to-day -day needs, and looking forward in technology. And I think it will, if it was true in 1977, it would certainly be true now in 2000 and 2001 and on a going forward basis. I believe that this will help us and the government to effectively, more effectively, look at what we call waste, fraud, and abuse. I believe that it is a management tool that companies, uh, many companies, Fortune 500 companies employ. They do a five-year view, not just of budgeting, but of the actual money that will be spent, where they're going to spend it, how it will be spent, what the priorities are, that we will have an opportunity to look more fully uh, at um, agency heads, to ask them to predict and to show Congress uh, what their needs are, instead of on a year-to-year -year budgeting on a, on a longer, uh, look, more forward-looking basis. And so I think that uh, if we look at what is happening in the states, uh, we can glean uh, the, the good part of those opportunities. Uh, and, Chairman, I'm very proud to be a part of this effort um, for us to have an in-depth look and opportunity to know uh, what the advantages could be, where the pitfalls are, and I believe that the administration, being here today as they are, will be able to present us with the view from a great deal of wisdom, uh, men and women who have participated with President Clinton in running this government uh, for the last seven years. Uh, they have been through uh, not only uh, trial and tribulation, but they have seen um, some things that I think that in their, in their last few months might offer us an opportunity to make things better. And it is this making better, this scrubbing uh, down that I think is very important, and I appreciate you bringing this to light. And we're certainly proud to have you as uh, part of the uh, process, uh, Mr. Sessions, and uh, I'd like to further uh, buttress your arguments by providing, uh, without objection in the record, a litany of the last decade of roll call votes that we've had on the budget uh, on the House floor showing uh, how great that work ethic has uh, continued to prevail here. So uh, with uh, that, Mr. Liu, we uh, again welcome you and look forward to your testimony.
And I would like to change a little bit the focus of the way we testify. Rather than making the case strictly for biennial budgeting, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks that my predecessors have made. And I'd like to focus on some of the practical considerations that I think that we need to be worked through for biennial budgeting to work. Because I think that there is, whenever you make significant change, the risk that you sometimes don't address just the problem that you're trying to solve and other things that, 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 that may create problems or fail to deal with some practical considerations. I think the important channeling for this committee is to work on getting a proposal and actually the law and how to be a proposal that works. I'd like to focus on some of those issues. The, uh, the law is going to, uh, any law that provides for biennial budgeting uh, will set forth procedures. I think it's important that the procedures uh, be realistic. Uh, and I would start by saying that I don't believe it's realistic to think that the second year of a biennium will be a year of no executive branch proposals and no legislative actions. I think that the law has to provide for a realistic updating process so that in the second year, uh, there would be an orderly review of supplemental uh, requests and changes so that there would be an active policy process in the second year. The challenge. The challenge is to have it be an orderly process so that in the second year, we'll, we don't end up doing 13 separate appropriation bills that become a kind of disorderly way of accomplishing what we do today with the regular appropriations process. I think in, in there is a lot of the challenge of making biennial budgeting work. I think that there's a need for flexibility in the executive branch for biennial budgeting to work. There will be a need for reprogramming authority. There will be a need to give agencies some more discretion. But there will also be a need to have the committees, the appropriations committees, have oversight responsibilities through notice, through, through uh, uh, approval mechanisms. And I think the challenge is going to be to find the right balance, to have the balance be so that the executive branch agencies can work in a smooth way and so that the appropriating committees don't end up micromanaging at such a small level that we have a kind of paralysis in the second year. It won't work if we end up with no ability to change in the second year. It won't work if we end up with too much executive discretion. It won't work if we have too much legislative micromanagement. I think it comes down uh, beyond process to questions of comedy between the branches and whether we can make it work. A lot of the problems in the current appropriations process are not written in the rule book, not written in the statutes. The problem uh, has been a difficulty of reaching agreement uh, and reaching agreement in a timely way. Uh, to the extent that we have to do it once, not twice, in a two-year cycle for all 13 appropriation bills, I think that's a good thing. I think it will certainly allow more time for management issues to get attention in the executive branch. I believe it will allow more time for management issues to get attention in the legislative branch as well. Uh, now, if it turns out that reaching agreement on two-year appropriation bills is more difficult than we think, and if the process leaves us in a state of limbo for a long period of time, that would be a concern to me. And I would note that points of order as an enforcement mechanism are very useful as a tool for blocking certain action. It's not a very powerful tool for forcing action. And I think that we have to all think very hard about what we can do to make the process work so that there will be action on a two-year uh, budget if we have a law that creates these rules to provide for two-year budgeting. Because if you get into the 15th, 18th month of a cycle and you don't have an agreement on the two-year budgeting, then you're expanding the window of uncertainty that we often have at the beginning of a fiscal year now when we run for a month or two on continuing resolutions. Um, I'd like to address two other issues briefly, and then I'd be delighted to, to answer your questions. The, uh, the idea that biennial budgeting is a, an answer to all, question, all the problems of the budget process I think is not correct. I think there are many things about the budget process that need to be addressed. The President's budget made several proposals, including having a Social Security solvency lockbox, providing for <laughs> Medicare transfers to ensure Medicare solvency, extending the PAYGO rules so that we have fiscal discipline at a time of surplus, and extending realistic budget caps, discretionary caps, so that we have discipline mm -hmm. in the appropriations process. I think it's very important that all of these issues be considered, not just biennial budgeting apart from all the others. On the other hand, I would be very concerned about what the chairman uh, referred to as uh, controversial budget proposals that could be added into a bill. Biennial budgeting has many, many benefits, uh, but if attached to it are provisions that would either 
relieve the pressures of the current PAYGO system or make it easier to take a path that I would describe as a path away from fiscal discipline, I think it does more harm than good. So I think that the challenge has to be to design a workable biennial budgeting proposal, keep it clean of dangerous proposals, and hopefully expand the discussion to include what we think are very positive budget reforms beyond biennial budgeting. Let me close, if I may, on a, on a positive note. I think that my experience as OMB director is uh, only reinforced my belief that what we do on the management side is every bit as important as what we do on the budget side. The frustration that I have is that the budget process takes up so much of my time, so much of the time of the people that we deal with in Congress, that we don't have as much of the year as I would like to devote to making programs work better. I think biennial budgeting, if it's properly designed, could very much help alleviate those pressures. I think that beyond design, we have to take very seriously and take a look at our own practices as both executive branch and legislative branch representatives and ask ourselves, can we make it work even if the rules are written right? I believe we can. I think we should try to. And I applaud the committee for uh, taking the step it's taken to advance the debate on this issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu. That's a uh, very helpful testimony. And you've, of course, raised that uh, important issue of flexibility, which was one of the concerns that, uh, that opponents have addressed. You touched on something that uh, I'd like you to expand on just a little, and you said a new supplemental structure. And I wondered what you envisage as a structure, because, it, it, you know, the, again, opponents have said, ah, oh, all you're going to do is have a load of additional supplemental appropriations bills. And, and, uh, and you said, obviously, we don't want to have 13 appropriations bills in that second year when we want to focus on oversight. but there clearly is uh, that question that's before us. So what would you uh, I, I think that, that uh, the, the supplemental process is one that, uh, if properly managed, doesn't have to become the equivalent of 13 appropriation bills. I, I, I think just yesterday we saw the Appropriations Committee take action in the House on a very substantial supplemental appropriation bill uh, where there's been uh, an effort between the branches to work uh, on, on, on resolving issues that couldn't have possibly been addressed uh, last October. Uh, the, the notion that in the second year of a biennium, uh, we will have, uh, we will look back and say that all of the decisions that we made at the beginning of the biennium are 100% uh, correct given changing needs, changing priorities, I don't believe is realistic. I think that the executive branch needs to take a review and make proposals. I, I think that what I would emphasize is that putting together changes is a very different undertaking than putting together separate requests for 100 percent of the funding of each department. When I look at a supplemental appropriation, it takes you know, days of analysis. When I look at, at an agency appropriation for each agency of government, it takes weeks and months of work. It's a, it's a very different uh, magnitude if you're looking at the 5, 10 percent that you're changing than if you're looking at absolutely everything from the ground up. Oftentimes, repeating the things that you've done very recently, uh, but that you have to go through if you're going to go through every line item. Uh, the, the discipline of looking at what's changed and does it warrant new action narrows very much the scope of what you're addressing. I think the administration should propose changes. I think Congress should have a, an orderly procedure to review changes. And I think that the, the danger of not having an orderly process is it, it kind of dissolves into a year-round process where there's always changes being proposed and always changes being acted on. I think that would end up taking a lot of time, and that would not be a good use of either the executive branch or the legislative branch's time. So the, the, the desire to say that a two-year budget doesn't require another look, I don't think is realistic. The challenge is to design that second look so that it's efficient. So this is what you described in your prepared text as sort of the mid-cycle review uh, process itself. You know, as uh, has been pointed out by all of my colleagues here, uh, we spend a great deal of time on this, and you, on, on the budget process, you talked about the fact that you spend so much time on it other than getting into these other areas. As far as the other agencies of the government are concerned, what, what would you say the, the uh, amount of time they spend on the budget process itself is? Well, I, I think that it's hard to answer a question like that statistically. I mean, you answer it kind of, of impressionistically. The, uh, the year, the budget year never ends. Um, if you look at, uh, at where, you know, where we are uh, when Congress finishes its work on the appropriations bills, it's supposed to be September 30th, but in our recent experience, it's more likely been November 30th or, you know, or October 30th. Our budget process is well underway uh, at that point. 
We usually start our OMB reviews, so that means the agencies have made their submissions to us already, around Columbus Day. Uh, we make our recommendations to the President uh, by the, before Thanksgiving, and we make our recommendations to the agencies uh, by Thanksgiving. From Thanksgiving until the end of the year, we work through with the agencies the process of resolving appeals of OMB uh, decisions on budget levels and ultimately take to the President issues that can't be resolved uh, short of that. Uh, then the process from January till the budget is sent up in February is a production process where, uh, where, we, uh, where we put together the many volumes that have to support the budget. The agencies are very involved in that. Uh, we're very involved in that. That is a less time-consuming process for the policy officials at the agency, but it's a very time-consuming process for the budget officials. The, uh, the period of time from January until March used to be the time when Congress shifted to the, the, the focus on, on budget matters, and the administration was relatively uh, less involved. I would say that the, uh, the, the extensive hearing process uh, which I am not criticizing, which I think is a very uh, worthwhile process, takes a very substantial amount of time for not just OMB but agency heads for most of February and March. Uh, I know I talk to my colleagues uh, who are very, very much involved in preparing for their testimony. They take very seriously the need to come prepared and, and to have them be good sessions, and that involves senior management as well as budget offices. Uh, at the point after uh, uh, you know, March, uh, the Appropriations Committee begins working on, on, uh, on its appropriations bills. The committees are very much in contact with the departments, with OMB. That process goes pretty much until the end, uh, when the cycle begins all over again. So there's really not much of a break. Now, I'm not saying it takes 100 percent of the time of policy officials, but there's virtually no part of the year that isn't uh, very much uh, affected by work on the budget process. I think if you had a biennial budget uh, system in place, you would have a real chance of creating a six-month window when budget matters took a much lower share of senior policy officials' time, which would allow more time to be spent on management, and then as that filters down through the layers of government even more so. So I, I think there's definitely a benefit to be had from trying to st stretch the process out. Let me just ask one final question. You said that since 1993 the administration has been a proponent, and I know President, I have talked to the President about this. He's been a, a, a strong supporter uh, of it. Was this uh, something that you've always supported, or have you come to this position after your years of experience of working for Mr. <laughs> Moakley, among others? Um, I must say, personally, I take <clears throat> process changes uh, with a, a little bit of a grain of salt, because if they're not backed up by the commitment to make them work, they can't work. You can write a perfect process, but it's not the process mm -hmm. that makes decisions. It's the people working in the process right. that make decisions. I, I, I have always thought that the appropriations process took up more of the year than it should. Uh, I, mean, I remember you know, 20 years ago seeing this diagram that looked like a worm that described the budget cycle where there's an 18-month period where parts of the process are always overlapping each other. Um, I must say my biggest concern is whether workable procedures would be backed up by the participants in the process to make it work. And it does take comedy between the branches. It takes a willingness to allow for some executive discretion, to allow for some congressional oversight, to work in a collaborative way. We've been better at that at some times than we have at others. I think that that is a challenge that can't be written on paper. It's something that people have to commit themselves to. And if we're committed to put that in, I think this is a very good idea, and it's one that I very much support. So you've always been a proponent of the biennial budget process, then, I guess? Since I've had a firm opinion on the matter, the yeah, answer okay. is yes. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I suspected. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, you uh, make a good case for um, wanting to have some time to do your job as uh, a manager and senior management let your senior managers do things other than crunch numbers. I think that's uh, a very reasonable uh, and uh, refreshing and probably uh, welcome news to the American public. The uh, same, I think, applies to the dual role we have here, uh, which is uh, legislation and oversight. And I think that's one of the reasons we're looking at this from the point of view is can we have a little more time for oversight of the way you manage? Uh, and, and I think that's one of the good things about our system is that it provides for a series of checks and balances, and I think this is part of it. And I do think that the budget cycle 
uh, as it is presently constituted, uh, does tend to take away uh, our, um, certainly our time, uh, and it's become such a workload that, uh, for all of us, that it um, probably has a negative impact on our oversight uh, in total. I won't say from point to point, but I would just say in total, I think we can do better at oversight. That may not be welcome news but uh, uh, to you, but I think it's welcome news to America because I think that's what we're set up. And I wanted to ask uh, your view. You talked about the process and you talked about other parts of the process, other reform, and I wanted to uh, go into one of those areas which I think might be considered other. And it's uh, something that has struck me uh, as chairman of the Intelligence Committee. We have, uh, I'm told by CBO, something like 130 programs worth about $120 billion, which don't get authorized, but nevertheless get appropriated uh, through uh, the magic of the Rules Committee or, or some other system that we have created for ourselves here. Um, in the Intelligence Committee, we have a mandatory uh, requirement for authorization. If the authorizing committee doesn't do its work, <coughs> Uh, theoretically, no funds get appropriated. Now, there's lots of ways to deal with that theoretically, but by and large, I think that gives us an extra incentive to do our authorization work timely and go through the budget uh, properly. And I'm wondering, uh, since that only applies to the Intelligence Committees and one other two discrete programs uh, that I can think of, if you have a view on whether or not we ought to be a little bit more attentive to following the process of authorization and then appropriation. Does that give us a, a salutary gain in our process? I think that the authorization process is a very important one, and if you look over the last 15, 20 years, it probably has not worked the way it was intended to work, uh, to, to put it mildly. The uh, part of it has to do with the calendar which doesn't permit authorization legislation to get the time on the floor and if it doesn't get the time on the floor the incentive to produce it in committee goes down and it just kind of flows through the system so i think that freeing up floor time and having a calendar where authorizations were expected to be considered would be a real a real gain um, i think that the notion of appropriating with and without authorizations is something that you have to divide into several categories uh, authorizations that have expired where there is an authorization that has been in place uh, or very different circumstance from programs that have never been authorized at all. And I don't find it uh, to be uh, as troubling uh, for appropriators to take the liberty of appropriating uh, in areas where there's a lapsed authorization, but there is a clear policy that's been written. I think it would be a kind of artificial constraint given our ability to process all of the authorizations to have programs just go away because the authorization date has passed. I think that there's a lot of activity in the appropriations process that is either on the line or across the line in terms of creating new authorizations. And I think one has to take uh, those matters on a case-by-case -case basis. I think a rigid rule that says never appropriate without authorization, no waivers, would leave us un unable to address uh, changing circumstances in a timely manner. I think if you go too far, it does a lot to diminish the ability of the Congress to have the kind of uh, serious, detailed review of policy that should go in to putting initiatives together. And uh, I think one has to find the right balance. I appreciate that. I think I'm probably about the same place. I, I, I know that there's no such thing as, as a, a permanent fixed in cement solution for anything around here. But I would, I'm, I'm leaning towards trying to find incentives uh, so that there are rewards for authorization as opposed to particularly new authorization. I agree with your distinction. And I think that's a useful comment, and I appreciate your help. Jack, welcome back. And, you know, we're all, and I, I know our mutual friend, Speaker O'Neill, would be tickled that to see you in your new capacity. I, I hear that you're in favor, but I, I, it sounds like you're very cautious about favoring it. Uh, I find that the fight doesn't come so much in the budget process as it does in the policy decisions. I mean, that's, I think the process isn't bad. It's just that you just can't get people together to agree on, on what should be in the budget and how much, and that's where the fight takes place, would you say? Well, I think the process today creates more friction uh, because of the calendar than it needs to. Uh, when, when the budget resolution is up in the air until the spring, and the Appropriations Committee can't begin its work in a serious way until late spring, and then we get into the summer and we're seeing September, October on the horizon, 
uh, it becomes more difficult to work through the policy differences. I think one of the benefits of biennial budgeting is it would give the appropriators more advanced notice of what their targets are. It would give the appropriators time to work through a lot of the policy differences. I don't disagree with your basic notion that it's policy, not process. I mean, it, it, it wasn't a process pro uh, issue that caused the appropriations process to go until November. But it was a calendar issue that forced those issues to come to ripen after Labor Day uh, when we had a September 30th deadline ahead of us. Is it realistic, Jack, for an incoming president in his first four months to come out with a two-year budget? I think that's one of the biggest practical considerations, the transition issues. I think it, there is a one-time transition that has to be thought through very carefully. I went back and looked at what our schedule was uh, when Leon took over OMB in 1993, and he sent a, uh, a short document up uh, in February on time, and the longer documents for a one-year budget up in April. I think realistically, you know, that was an OMB director who had vast experience in, uh, in, in federal budgeting. Uh, no one's going to do it much faster than that. And the notion that you could do a two-year budget by February, March is just unrealistic. I think April is a stretch. I think that what it says to me is that for the first two years uh, of, of uh, a new system, uh, there really needs to be very careful consideration given to the practical realities of the transition. I think that it ought to be uh, fully in effect at the beginning of a, a Congress. I think it would be ideal for it to be in the middle of a presidential term so that you didn't have everything changing all at once. And th there are ways that one could design the transition so that you could have the process put in place where, on a technical basis, OMB is going to have to redo how the computer systems run, how the agency guidance is put out, what the agencies give us, to work the kinks out uh, when the time pressure to absolutely comply is not as great. Uh, and to have the idea be that after a two-year transition, you're fully in the new system. I think to wait and say, let's start in two years, creates the same problems again two years from now. So at any point, it's going to be difficult. But it's particularly difficult at the beginning of a new administration where everything is new. Does not also the biennial budget process really create an avalanche of supplemental budgets in the off year? Well, I don't think it's an avalanche exactly. I think that one ought to expect that there would be a substantial need for supplementals. Um, you know, we, we have seen in the last number of years that we have substantial needs for supplementals with annual uh, budgeting, uh, in part because we can't predict where it's going to flood and where hurricanes will hit, in part because changing international situations require new commitments that uh, we couldn't possibly foresee. I think those things will continue to come up, only a little more so because they're the normal changes from year to year. I think what, you know, if you look at the federal budget, uh, I don't I have an exact percentage, but an awful lot of it doesn't change from year to year. We spend a lot of our time making the same decisions over and over again. An awful lot of the activity is in the last 10 percent, which is where the change really is. In the second year, if we focused on that 10 percent and we had an orderly process, I don't think it would be anywhere near as time consuming as putting a full budget together or in, in terms of Congress processing 13 full appropriations bills. Uh, I do think that there's a risk, as I noted in my formal remarks and in my opening remarks, that it could kind of dissolve into 13 ad hoc appropriation bills. And then I think you end up worse off than you started. So it's going to take discipline, and I think the structure, the process can help provide that discipline, and the people working in it have to make it work. I think it is worth the effort. I think that the challenge of managing the current process is probably one that future administrations and future Congresses will share the frustrations that I and my predecessors have, have noted. Um, I think that the, the, the changes have to be well designed, and that's why I've tried today to focus on what the issues that have to be uh, uh, really carefully dealt with are. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Would a um, two-year cycle create less incentive for getting an agreement at the end of the first year? Because it seems to me that the longer we drag this out, the more um, well, the, the more there, we're getting pressured into our next year cycle right now. There is certainly the risk. Uh, the end of the fiscal year is an action-forcing event. The notion of being in a continuing resolution doesn't strike any one as a particularly good idea. It's not good from the agency's perspective. It's not good from the Congress's perspective. I think it diminishes public regard for government because it makes it clear that we're having difficulty making the basic decisions that we're expected to make. The, uh, I think the notion of slipping months into a fiscal year 
is not attractive under the current system. It would be not attractive with biennial budgeting. I think that the same pressures that drive you to reach conclusion now would drive you to reach conclusion later. I do think the challenge of reaching a two-year uh, agreement would be slightly larger, significantly larger than the challenge of reaching a one-year solution. Uh, I think that uh, that if we if we uh, get into the habit of thinking in two-year terms, it will get easier than it seems today. I think it will be harder the first year than it is two years later when it's done you know, for the second time. Uh, but I think that if you get well into a fiscal year and you haven't reached agreement, it's not just the two-year budget you haven't reached agreement on. You haven't reached agreement on the one-year budget, which means you're in the same situation you're in today, operating on continuing resolutions. I think that there is another alternative which would, I think, undermine the benefits of biennial budgeting, which is waiving points of order and doing one-year budget because you can't reach agreement on a two-year budget. If you do that, then you've ended up back where you started. And, and if it's done in a timely manner, arguably you're no worse off, but you haven't gotten the benefits because you're going to be right back the next year doing the, the same budget negotiations, and you won't have created that window of opportunity for management and oversight. In virtually every administration, the Congress and the administration have differences in respect of priorities and spending. They want to control spending in one area and add to spending in another based on programmatic priorities. Um, would our ability to get control of budget spending, get restrained spending, be lost if you've got opportunities for supplementals the following year? I don't think it's supplementals uh, per se that uh, are the threat to the discipline and spending. I think it's uh, it's the people who write and propose supplementals uh, w w that we have to, to look uh, towards. The supplemental is no different than any other spending measure uh, in terms of, of uh, how we, uh, we 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 use it. The uh, I think the, 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 if I go back to the current system, you know, we made a real effort in this year's budget to set discretionary caps that would enable us to live within the caps and to maintain fiscal discipline. I think as you mark up a budget resolution this year, uh, you face the challenge that I think is really the answer to your question. Pretending that the caps can be uh, put at an unrealistic level will force the kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, machinations that get around caps that I think have given budgeting a bad name in the last few years. Uh, I think if you have realistic caps, the fact that you need a supplemental doesn't make it worse. I think if you have unrealistic caps, you're either underestimating what you're going to spend because you're going to get around it, or you're implicitly signing on to policy that many of us find unacceptable uh, because it would mean cuts that would not be tolerable, whether it's in education or, or other areas. You've uh, made some excellent points on the need for the administration, in particular your staff, to have time for oversight and management to manage programs, which you call management, we call oversight. Um, do you consider the oversight process and the legislative branch to be a burden, or can it be helpful to you? Well, I don't know that that's a choice. I mean, it's certainly a burden. I can't say that preparing for an oversight hearing is, it doesn't take time and effort. I know I personally... But is that helpful? Um, I think it can be helpful. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's no more intrinsically helpful or unhelpful than our own internal review process. It depends how well it's done and whether it identifies issues in a, in a, in a useful way. Um, the fact that it is a burden doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Uh, but I think we have to understand that it is a burden, and, uh, and a lot of burdens are good burdens. So uh, that's why I say it's not really a choice. I think that the oversight function uh, ought to be viewed not as an inquisitorial function, um, but more as a how do we make a program work better function. There's been a kind of trend towards uh, using oversight as a way of, of sort of catching uh, the wrongdoers. Um, I think that most, the most useful function of oversight is to engage in management uh, cons reviews in, in the sort of, we've designed these programs together, how do we make them work well? And if you find something that's wrong, then you, you deal with it appropriately. Um, yeah, I don't want to paint anything with a, with a single brush. There's very useful oversight hearings that go on in many, many committees. But when you ask the, 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 you know, for an, my reaction to oversight, it's very much how it's done. We've had testimony before one of our subcommittees of this committee with respect to the ability to do oversight, and we've had four or five chairmen before this panel have said that it's very difficult to get information out of the administration to do their job, and particularly the justice. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with those 
comments that we've had. Well, I, I know that I, we, we have had a lot of experience in recent uh, years where the requests for information have been at a level of detail that is unprecedented uh, and I don't think is a level that necessarily gets at the policy issues that, that, that are really uh, at hand. Um, the amount of time it takes to assemble some of the, the data crosses the line from a burden that's a constructive burden to a, to a, a, a real time problem. Uh, there are issues of executive branch privilege where certain internal uh, documents, internal decision-making processes, I don't think are fully appropriate for discussion at hearings. The president is entitled to have uh, confidential discussions with the people around him. Um, I don't know that this is a partisan issue. I mean, I'm sure one can come up with examples of Democratic committees and Republican committees that have done the same thing. I, I think that, uh, that, that the, the tendency to try and identify a not terribly useful piece of information that's very difficult to produce and make the charge of material non-disclosure has gotten to be a little bit of a concern. <laughs> I, I can see that in some committees that were here before testifying for us. I think the Resource Committee had a legitimate complaint on a simple request that just was being, they are being stiffed on. Uh, but thank you for your help. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Director Liu, I'd like to go back to some of your earlier comments with my colleague, Mr. Moakley, and by and large, he asked the question, when? When should we do this? And I found your response uh, very interesting, and by and large, you said, well, we, we could do it now. Leon Panetta, when he became the director, did a remarkable job then because he had the experience in the background. But I'm not sure that the next administration, whoever that is, would necessarily view that as an advantage. Now, that's a, a summary of what I heard you say. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Because we're talking about the advantages of this system, what it would provide, and then I heard you say, oh, but maybe not in the hands of a new person. No, that, that wasn't what I meant to, to be Good. saying, Mr. Sessions. Um, I, I think that uh, wh what I meant to be saying was that with budgeting for a single year, it wasn't until middle of April that Leon was able to get a full year budget to the Congress. If it had been a two-year budget, I suspect it would have been more like May or June. If it had been May or June, that would have closed the window for congressional action, I think, unreasonably. I don't think Congress can wait until June to meet a September 30th deadline on appropriations. I think that, that, that for the, the, the first time biennial budgeting is put in place, for anyone, ourselves included, it would have been a heroic effort to do it in the first year of a new administration. There's an awful lot of things that are different in the first year of an administration. First of all, uh, the, the budget decisions are being made uh, you know, much later in the process. They're being made uh, in, in late January and early February instead of November and December. Um, I think when you switch for the first time to a biennial system, the bookkeeping all changes. Uh, you have real decisions for two years, and there are a lot of processes that have to be put in place that one could anticipate and do some of the groundwork early, but inevitably when that goes into effect for the first time, it will require effort to make it, substantial effort to make it work. Uh, I didn't mean to be suggesting we could have done it, but someone else could. No, I think I, it's a generic transition issue. Right. Okay. So let's go back to Mr. Moakley's question and the question that I'm posing. When? Well, I think that when if should we do this? Yeah. In any problem that you're try, trying to solve where there are transition issues, you can say, oh, let's not do it because it's going to be hard. Or you can say, let's get started and provide for a reasonable transition so that we can be there as soon as possible. We've supported biennial budgeting. We continue to support biennial budgeting and, and think that the time for action is sooner, not later. Um, what I was suggesting is that enacting it doesn't mean saying that on February 15th or whatever the date is next year, there should be submitted to Congress a biennial budget. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's realistic. Mm -hmm. I think April is a stretch. I think if you make the deadline June, it gives Congress very little time to work. I think that, that, that one of the things that we would want to work through with the Congress in developing a schedule is going through a lot of the nitty-gritty practical considerations and reaching a sort of mutual conclusion as to what's realistic to do in the first year and the second year and then 
in the third year where you go to the full uh, implementation of biennial budgeting, have it be 100 percent in place. I, I, I don't have a schedule in mind today, sure. but that's kind of notionally what I think uh, would need to happen. So you believe that if this committee did move forward, if this House and the Senate move forward, that it would could be wise to do that now mm -hmm. and then whoever. Absolutely. You, good. So, so you believe that now's the time and that the transition then and the understanding should be flexible. We should understand that the time frames might change a little bit, but that it would be a workable thing for the next administration, whoever it is, would have an advantage of this biennial budget. With the understanding that in the first year, I don't think it would be true biennial budgeting. It would be the, the beginning of the transition so that you... Well, certainly we make provisions to where we've, we're giving next year's budget early on. You might, yeah, I, I'll just throw an idea out. You might want to have uh, a later deadline for the biennial budget than you do for the first one uh, so that, that, that there's a little bit more time. The transition. To you may want to have uh, a notional second year budget that's not binding for the first year. There, there are a lot of different ways to do it. I think the challenge is to get the processes up and running, to have the decision making process start to work in two year rather than one year terms, uh, you know, to change some of the cultural parts of the budget process that are slow to change. Uh, it's not just writing it down on paper. It's, it's changing the way a lot of people in a lot of places do their work. Good. And now's the time. Well, it, it'll just take longer if you wait. Yeah. Um, the second part is we focused a lot of, and you have of your testimony on the process that Congress goes through. Can you give us a little bit of insight about your, the, the office that you hold as director of of managing the money, managing a, the, the agencies and the, their performance, what would be an efficiency that would be gained directly that you see within agencies? Uh, within agencies? Uh, sure, uh, which is your job. Yeah. I think that uh, from an OMB perspective, uh, we, have, we don't have a separate management uh, process. It's an integrated budget and management process. When we do our budget reviews, mm -hmm. We discuss the management issues simultaneously with the budget issues. And we have in our budget 24 priority management objectives, which are very closely tied to our budget objectives. It's something that I'm very proud that we've, we've been able to accomplish in the last few years to not have sort of abstract management principles, but real tangible goals that are tied to the, the budgetary priorities that we have. And we've made progress on a good many of them. Um, I think that if we had more time, uh, we would be able to work at a senior level on more issues like that with the departments. Uh, I think that we have real benefits when we have a senior level of attention to those kinds of issues. Whether it's our experience with the INS, we're working together from the senior levels on down, and I mean the Attorney General and myself right down through the budget offices. We made a lot of progress clearing up the backlog of people who were waiting uh, to, to, to become naturalized Americans. It involved coming up with a management plan. It, came, it involved coming up with a personnel plan. It involved having the money behind it. It wouldn't have happened if it had not been involving the, the senior officials in both departments. There's only so many of those things you can do uh, when most of your year is spent uh, in, uh, in the process of working through either internally within the administration or in negotiations with Congress, the, the budget uh, funding levels. And I think that, uh, that, that the notion of expanding those kinds of opportunities for each one you do, it's a major problem that you have a good chance of solving. I thank you for being here today, and I will tell you that I believe that uh, President Clinton is well served by your uh, duty to our country, and I appreciate you, you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to follow up, if I might, on just a, a point you made responding to Mr. Linder's question about oversight. We have a lot of uh, reason to believe that oversight uh, can be viewed by different perspectives where you are in governance. And, and um, you said that you were a little concerned that uh, our focus on catching wrongdoers was misplaced. Um, and, and I would say that it is misplaced if it is involving partisan politics, if the oversight is being done strictly for partisan political reasons. I would agree, and I, I share, I think, uh, what is a universal concern, uh, that we not uh, contaminate the substance of government uh, with too much partisanship. But I am concerned that, um, that anybody would use the uh, allegation that it is partisan when we are trying to make a substantial oversight uh, review of a matter. 
And we have found time and time again that um, we do a very high percentage of our business on the Hill uh, in public session, mm -hmm. in open door. And the executive branch does a very low percentage uh, of its business, necessarily, uh, in public session, usually behind closed door. That creates clearly a job. Uh, and quite often when we do the job well, uh, using uh, the, the tools, the GAO or the, uh, the various uh, organizations we have here to, to pursue these matters of oversight, we find uh, we, we get uh, information. And then if we can't get the follow-up information from uh, the executive side of government, uh, we become frustrated. Mm -hmm. Usually by that time, the media's got it because we do a high percentage of our business in public. So the question then is, what do you do next? And one of the reasons I am for biennial budgeting is because I'd like to have the time to consider what do we do next when we get into that situation. And I wondered if you had an observation on that um, relative to the response you made to Mr. Linder. Well, I, I guess my response is I, I personally have a very low tolerance for wrongdoing. I don't mean to be suggesting that you or we shouldn't uh, be concerned about it. I, what I meant to be suggesting uh, was that most management issues that we need to work through don't involve people who are trying to do bad things or who even did things that were wrong. It's just problems that are that are not front page of the newspaper problems that you need to spend time working through to, to make things work better. Um, I think that uh, you know, the, 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 the question of what you do when you find out things are wrong, whether it's because a process doesn't work or because some people did something they shouldn't have done, is the hardest part. It, at some point, obviously, if it's a question of real wrongdoing, it becomes a legal question. But from a con perspective of management and, and program oversight, it, it's a question of what in the structure of a program needs to change to create a higher likelihood that the job will get done. I think there's been a very useful increase in focus on performance measures. Um, but and I'll just note, and this is kind of similar to my reaction to Mr. Linder's question, I'm very concerned that as we focus on performance, that we not make it a club that we use to say to agencies, you, you fail to meet your standard, we're going to take your money away. Having performance measures work requires having people take an honest appraisal and assessing realistically what they could have done better with the opportunity to fix it. And I think the oversight and the management process has to be aimed at how do you get things to be fixed, not how do you get a gotcha where you take people's money away or you find someone who did something wrong. If people did something wrong, you know, the law should be fully used to, to take the appropriate steps. But in order to make programs work, you have to have a window where you identify a problem and you try and fix it. And I think a little bit, I don't mean to suggest that it's all partisan. Uh, it, it's, it's something about the high pressure environment in which we govern uh, is focused more on finding the problem than providing a window to, to, to solve them. I think that's a good answer. I, I think we, we spend an awful lot of time, way too much time, um, uh, in this what I will call standoff between uh, the, the circle, the wagons mentality and the gotcha mentality. And I think that is the mentality of this town, inside the Beltway anyway. And I think that there is as much waste uh, of time in, in that effort uh, as not. On the other hand, there are very legitimate questions. So somehow, somewhere, somebody's got to lead us out of this. And, and maybe if we get into biennial budgeting, we It'll can... We can have the time to sit down and figure out how to do this instead of just responding to what's in the newspaper today, which would be nice. Uh, I think then that gets down to what I said. I, I think that most of the problems of the policy differences instead of the process. I, I think that, you know, what do you do with the situation? Some people, oh, we should do this, someone else, we should do this. And that's where the fighting takes place. And I think that's where the slowdown comes by the way the the Congress handled some of these things based on policy differences and not the budget process. Um, if I could, I can't my time. Uh, well, I'll put my time. <laughs> now I can reclaim my time. Thank you. Uh, I would agree that there is some of it as policy difference in that. I think we're all, we all benefit from having an airing of policy debate. I mean, that's part of what we all come together to do in representative government. That's wonderful. I, I'm, talking more, um, I'm talking more about process, however, and, and it does happen this way. I'll give you a case in point. There is, a, uh, there is an alleged uh, activity going on called Echelon. Uh, Echelon is, involves something that's near and dear to all Americans. 
uh, it has to do with is Big Brother eavesdropping on, on Americans or American interests? And the answer, in my view, is no. But nevertheless, there's perception that the answer might not be no. Well, in order to satisfy properly um, the, the people who are asking those questions, you really have to get down pretty far uh, into the detail. Uh, of this and, and, uh, and respond case by case uh, of what our allegations may be. And my view is uh, if, if you are blocked from doing that, it creates a suspicion. Well, that's a process problem. That's not a policy problem. I think you would agree that is a process problem. You've got to be able to get through that process and you've got to have ultimate candor with the oversight committees who are responsible for those types of things. And I think when that candor breaks down, that you do have a breakdown in process, and I think that has happened. I've called it circle the wagons gotcha uh, either way, and I think that's where we are now. I'm hoping that we're going to buy some time through the chairman's leadership here on this biennial budgeting so that we can get out of that mentality into something a little bit more constructive. Mr. Linder. I just want to follow up on comments on the Results Act because my subcommittee will be having hearings on the 22nd of this month, I believe it is. Because each of the authorizing committees tends to look at your results act in different, through different prisms. As do each of the departments. Sure. <laughs> and, and what we'd like to formalize in terms of committee reports is some way to say, what was your mission when you asked for this money? How many people were you willing trying to serve, or how much were you going to spend to serve these people? And then when they come back, did you do it? Now, some kind of not an angry argument about. We're going to take your money away, but but formalize for the agencies who, because we haven't had the time or been as perspicacious on oversight as we should have been, take it rather lightly. Some of the agencies had to take this act more lightly than others do. And if we could find some can formal way to take, so all the agency heads would respond in the same way, and all the authorizing and oversight committees would look in the same light at it. We could have, I think, a legitimate discussion of was it a program that was worth the money spent? Did we serve it? And there are going to be changes from time to time in these programs and the needs of those programs. But uh, the Results Act was a good idea. It has not come to fruition yet, in my judgment. As you know, we worked with the Congress on the development of the, the GPRA. We, we believe in the goals of it. Um, I would, I guess, uh, make a couple of observations. First, the 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 challenge of measuring performance, uh, measuring results, is different for every agency and every program. We've tried to work with each of the agencies to develop meaningful measures. And I would say in some cases it's very hard. It's uh, legitimately very hard because the tangible outcomes, um, you take a, a, science, a scientific area, is your measure uh, breaking through uh, with Nobel quality research? Is your standard having well-managed research projects with or without breakthrough results, it's very difficult. Um, I think that to have a kind of, of mechanical approach, which I don't suggest that you've taken, you've taken a very much different approach, uh, to have a mechanical approach that you set a standard, you don't meet it, uh, there are consequences, kind of blurs the fact that there's hundreds of different uh, ways that results can be measured. And if you want agencies to do it right, if you want agencies to not circle the wagons, as Mr. Goss said, you have to create a kind of a safe zone to discuss what do you do with your own measurement of your results. Give you some freedom to fine tune your measurement if it turned out you designed your measure wrong, not just have immediate dire consequences because you failed to meet what turned out to be a badly defined measure. I've been trying through our internal executive branch efforts to try and with each agency make this part of the culture of the way they do their budgeting, the way they run their programs. I think that we have made tremendous strides you can have a conversation that is a results-oriented conversation in virtually any uh, agency, which you couldn't do six years ago. Yeah. Uh, I think to say that we're far down the road towards having crisp mechanisms that you could use for budgeting would be a big exaggeration. And I think it's, a, it's a, an important tool that needs to be given time to work properly, and I would look forward to the opportunity to work with you and others to do it in that kind of balanced way. What I react to is the suggestion that others have made that if they don't perform, we should take their money away. I think the circle the wagons mentality will just kill any effort for success if that's the approach we take. So as a practical matter, I think you need to, to have a much more uh, balanced uh, approach than that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moakley. I may get back. To, I, I agree with Porta Gus on, on his problem of not getting all the information. You, you've got to dig deeper. 
but I don't see how the biennial budget can fix that. I mean, that's that's just between the branches. I mean, that, I don't see how this takes any more time away from you. You still have the oversight to do it. I, I, and I can't. Now I can speak. Thank you very much. We've got to go into training on how to use these things. Um, I, I would say that if you have more time, uh, which I hope biannual budgeting will give us, to set up the safe harbor process that Mr. Lewis is talking about, you're going to get a good reward from it. I, I would say that, uh, again, let me use the committee I chair, which is as probably nonpartisan a committee as you can find uh, in Congress and for good cause. Uh, Next to, yes, of course, next to the Rules Committee. Um, the, um, in fact, the comparison is wonderful. Um, the, uh, we do have a safe harbor. We do have good oversight. We do have working trust. And it's because we have been able to spend the time together and work out the processes together, because I think that's the highest priority uh, in that particular function at the moment. But not all other committees are as small and as select and as compact and have that capability. I wish other committees could replicate the things we use. I don't know if it's practical, but I would like to provide them the time allowance and say, use this time for oversight, create your safe harbors and your process of creating the trust and working confidence uh, so that you can do your oversight job in a fair way without of this being blocked with the wagons or having the people who are testifying think, uh-oh, they're going to figure out a way to get me and hang me. That's all I'm looking for. Thank you. Let me, uh, <laughs> Mr. Moakley. But you've created that safe harbor using annual authorizations. Remember, however, that we have a clear mandate to get our authorizations done, so we uh, work at a little, little tighter pace, shall I say, on our authorizations than some other committees, because as far as I know, we are the only committee that has that requirement. So I've only got one job as a chairman when I start out, and that's get the darn thing done, uh, and that means I've got to create the atmosphere to do it, and the way I do it and get the trust working back and forth is creating this safe harbor. Now, that takes time and it takes constant management, as I think Mr. Lewis would agree, that you cannot just simply set up a system and expect it to work because the personalities will kill it if, if you don't work at it. It's a little bit like a marriage. It really is. And I don't want to marry the executive branch, but a, a pleasant courtship would be all right. Yeah. You'd like to be there when they go on the honeymoon, though. Uh, probably. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm trying to think of the transition that that will create. I'm going to say, let me uh, make just a couple of comments and uh, and then uh, throw a couple of closing questions to you, Mr. Lou. First of all, on on the issue of um, extending the date for the first year of an administration, there are a number of pieces of legislation for biennial budgeting that have been proposed that do address that. The question that's out there is exactly what is that date going to be, and that's why from your initial remarks about the issue of flexibility, it seems to me that we need to spend some time and, and effort in thinking about what that date would be for the first year of a new administration. And, and I think there's a window, because the proposals I've seen have April. I think you start going later than April, right. and it raises real questions about the workability right. of, of the congressional timetable. Exactly. So yeah, you have yeah. constraints on both sides. That's exactly right. Um, the, the other uh, issue that I'd like to raise is, is uh, what you would see, the, how uh, the government performance review timetables, how those would fit within the uh, biennial budgeting. Uh, I think you would clearly have an opportunity to try to, to alternate the emphases uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, performance reviews and budget reviews. Uh, and I don't think you'd ever want to separate them. Uh, I think if you ended up having uh, performance uh, uh, reviews be totally independent of budgetary considerations, it would be a step backwards. And the challenge is how to ch switch the, the, the emphasis in terms of how much mm -hmm. time you have uh, to, to do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I, it, right now, we, we, we have to try and fight to get the performance issues into the budget schedule. If we had a year when the budget schedule was a little bit less intense, we'd have more time to spend on the, on the performance issues. Mm -hmm. But you, you've got to be doing both simultaneously. Let me just say this has been a very uh, interesting and I think helpful exchange that we've had. There are a number of members of the committee who obviously are not here, and we'd like you to, to uh, take some written questions uh, that may Delighted come to. from someone I, I'm sure you would. And I'd also like to make a request of you, and that is that the members of your technical staff work with us as we uh, fashion this uh, package, because we want to address Mr. Moakley's concerns and uh, some of the other concerns that have been raised by our colleagues as we 
proceed with uh, what is obviously uh, uncharted waters here. We, we try and be responsive. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here, uh, Mr. Liu. Thank you very much for inviting me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our next witness is the uh, director of the Congressional Budget Office, our friend Mr. Crippen, who, uh, unlike Mr. Liu, has many times testified before the uh, Rules Committee on a wide range of, of uh, budget process reform uh, matters. Often and on Friday mornings. Often on Friday mornings, exactly. Well, thank you very much. We understand that you have a uh, time constraint, and so we uh, don't want to keep you. We appreciate your uh, patience uh, through the uh, last witness. Thank you very much, Dan. Nice to see you. Chairman Dreyer, Ms. Moakley, Mr. Goss, Sessions. Um, we have a, a statement that's been submitted um, that is, uh, thank you, it uh, is a, a good statement that uh, will be uh, seen as more succinct and clear than what I'm about to say. Um, I recall in uh, 1981, Mr. Chairman, as uh, Senator, as uh, Mr. Moakley and uh, Mr. Liu were talking, <coughs> I was a newly minted PhD starting to work for Howard Baker. And uh, there were a number of my classmates and I who had, uh, had established a tradition of, in December, going sailing. And so not long after I started for the senator, I asked whether it would be possible to go sailing in December. And he said, well, of course, we're going to be out of session by Thanksgiving. And so I made plans accordingly. To make a long story short, of course, by the time we came to time for me to go, the Congress was still in session. Uh, President Reagan had vetoed a number of appropriation bills. He was about to veto a continuing resolution. And I went back then, of course, to the senator and said, uh, well, time has come for me to go. Is that all right? And he said, well, of course. He said, we're almost done, and there's just another couple of CRs to do. And so I turned to walk away, and he said, you just made one mistake. And I thought, well, this is the end of my short career uh, in the Senate. He said, like a damn fool, you believed me when I said we were going to be out uh, by Thanksgiving. I tell that story for two reasons. One, the situation we find ourselves in is not new. Um, these end-of-the-year appropriation conflicts have and will, I think, uh, probably take place under any circumstances. Second, Reagan using the veto and the year-end train wreck was to reduce spending. Uh, those we've been engaged in the last years arguably have been to at least change or increase spending. So uh, I would say that in this uh, little example as well, those who assert that biennial budgeting would cede power to the executive, I think ignore the impact on the chief executive. Uh, that's why uh, President Clinton and uh, uh, others have resisted things like an automatic continuing resolution um, because it does have the uh, ability to move power. But it, uh, again, depends on who's in power where and whether or not you think that's uh, desirable. In my discussions with members, I think I've uh, discerned at least three reasons behind the discontent with the, the current budget process. One, of course, as we've all talked about, is the annual end of the year uh, mess. Second is lack of oversight, which you've talked about a great deal this morning. And third, the, the comment often made that we spend our entire legislative lives, for some of us maybe our entire lives, uh, doing budget things. And uh, that, uh, too, must be addressed. Uh, I'd like to make just a few comments on each of these, uh, Mr. Chairman, and then open it uh, to whatever questions you might have. Of course, at the uh, end of the year train wreck issue, as I said, is not new. Um, the last time uh, we've had 13 appropriation bills finished on time. It's been almost a decade ago. Um, the automatic CR, of course, is one way to prevent the end of the year. There are other techniques, I suspect, in process reforms that would help that uh, issue as well. On oversight, uh, we have, uh, I think, over the last few years, had less and less oversight. It wasn't always so, although it's not to say that we've always had sufficient oversight. It may be oxymoronic to say there is such a thing, but it is hard work, and I think uh, the amount of oversight has been declining. In that sense, uh, the prospect of a two-year budget may be quite uh, useful and encouraging. I also would note, as you've discussed in the last moments with Director Liu, that the Performance and Result Act, uh, the, the first year is really this year of full reporting. In fact, the end of this month, I think, the, re the initial reports are due. And it would uh, be a test of at least two things. One is the ability of the executive branch to critique itself. Um, are these reports meaningful? Um, are they open? Are the wagons circled or not? Second is the con Congress's ability to respond to them. Will there be oversight hearings uh, based on these reports? Uh, we, will the reports be used by authorizing or appropriation committees, either one, as a useful management tool? So we will see. We have a real live experiment before us starting in a few weeks of uh, both of those issues, I think. So um, in looking at oversight issues, I would encourage you to look at how these reports are received and uh, how they're utilized. 
Third, on the, on the constant complaint to, of the uh, all we do is budget stuff, that's been around actually since the passage of the Budget Act uh, 25 years ago. Um, I first encountered it in 81, but it uh, wasn't even new then. Um, I would suggest perhaps it's the constraints of the budget process, not the time involved that's the real rub. Uh, people don't like the budget process because it defeats or deters or makes it harder to do things they would otherwise like to do. So the constraint may not be so much the floor time or the time involved, but rather the, uh, the resource allocation questions, the policy issues, and others. However, I would say in conclusion, Mr. President, that we are in a new world. We have this uh, ongoing surpluses. We have rapid economic developments in which we can't even keep up with our own forecasts of uh, revenue spending uh, growth in the economy. Um, we have the impending retirement of the baby boomers, my generation, and the need to reform Social Security and Medicare. So if biennial budgeting reduces the number of train wrecks, biennial budgeting promotes more oversight, if biennial budgeting appears to allow more time for non-budget issues, then it's worth a try, at least temporarily. We should remember the reason all 13 appropriation bills were completed on time in 1988 was because the Congress and the President struck a two-year budget deal. Um, so there is uh, some suggestion, at least it uh, worked in those circumstances, it might again. But it is a process change to address what may be uh, a potentially political problems, and I don't mean partisan, but rather uh, power and, and, and policy, as Mr. Moakley has said. That is, thin margins in both bodies and a president of the other party and the constraints inherent in creating and implementing a budget. People don't like budgeting. Uh, we only know, however, if we try a different process, that there will be unintended consequences, and so we need to be cautious about how we proceed. Um, I will conclude with a, uh, with a second story from 1981. Um, Howard Baker's first vote, and turned out to be his last vote as majority leader, was on increasing the debt limit, something that was uh, difficult to round up 51 Republicans in the Senate in 1981 to support. Uh, ultimately, he did, but it was a messy process, and he uh, looked with much uh, favor on the House process. I think it's called the Gephardt Rule, in which a budget resolution is automatically approved, uh, deemed approved by the House, when a budget resolution is passed. And so the House does not, as a regular matter, have to vote on it. And uh, so Baker sent me off to talk to Bob Dole to see if we couldn't implement the Gephardt rule in the Senate and change the Senate rules. And after some backing and forthing, Dole looked at me and he said, you know, someday we're going to be back in the minority. We don't want to foreclose all these opportunities of uh, legislating uh, in other means. So he was uh, not only prescient, but uh, resisted the change. And indeed, the Senate still has to vote on debt limits. Fortunately, given our economic circumstances, not as often these days. So all of that is to say one needs to be cautious about uh, making these changes. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Crippen. You uh, continue to provide a great deal of uh, very helpful input to this committee and to this entire process. I will say that uh, I recall many discussions that I've had with uh, Howard Baker in which he uh, has long been an advocate of making this a part-time Congress. Yeah, exactly. this, uh, <laughs> another uh, yeah. great story. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And uh, I will tell you that it was in the first instance of, instance of your three that you've outlined, which was the waning hours of the first session of the 106th Congress, that I successfully garnered 245 co-sponsors of my legislation calling for biennial budget I'm sure process. It was. <laughs> uh, that was not an accident. No. Yeah. No. I mean, that's it was part of our uh, timing process here. Um, you have a very important responsibility. Uh, at the CBO, and I, uh, I'm interested to know what impact a biennial budget process would have on your work uh, as uh, director of the CBO. It would obviously depend a great deal on how you choose to implement uh, the two-year budget. Um, we will, of course, do whatever Congress uh, wants and needs in that process. I would hope and anticipate that whether it has a formal role in terms of another budget resolution or not, that there would be ample opportunities to update um, our annual reporting or semi-annual reporting we do now on baselines, on economic changes and other things. Again, the things are changing at the moment quickly enough that uh, a few months makes a lot of difference on a budget outlook, even for the current year. As an example, the uh, revenues uh, for this budget year, uh, the one we're now in, are running higher than we anticipated even as uh, late as December. Um, that doesn't mean they're going to be higher, but it, at the moment they are somewhat higher. Uh, what that portends for this year could be important, but it uh, could be important for future years as well. Point simply being that I hope uh, that in, the, in a two-year process there would still be opportunities for the Congress to receive and incorporate updated uh, estimates for at least the first few years 
um, in which these things are changing quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. I don't anticipate, however, having said that, that there would be a great deal of change in overall workload. We put out three annual reports a year. I would anticipate, I mean, at the beginning of each year, I would anticipate we would continue to do that. Um, there may be some mid-session reporting requirements we currently comply with that uh, would go away, but in the main, I don't think it would change dramatically. In your work with the executive branch, uh, would you have any recommendation as to what the time frame would be for the first year of a new administration as far as its submission? No, I, I, I was listening with interest because I, frankly, had not thought all that much about uh, the implication of having a new president and a new budget process uh, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you could uh, enact the law uh, this year uh, and have its first true effective uh, biennial date be uh, three years or two years into the, the new president's administration, so mm -hmm. it would be 2003 mm -hmm. for his budget submission, um, just as you did, uh, as the Congress did uh, back in 70. Uh, four and five, when they uh, passed the original Budget Act, there was a one-year uh, kind of practice run for everybody uh, in which the uh, requirements weren't binding, but there was a budget resolution developed and, and everyone went through paces. Um, likewise, you'd probably want a similar kind of thing. So it might make sense, having, since we'll, we'll have a new president next year, to uh, pass the uh, enact the law this year, uh, but make it effective, officially effective, fully effective, uh, kind of the third year into his term. With your tie to the first branch of government, I um, was wondering uh, whether or what thoughts you have on the argument that opponents of biennial budgeting make that we are ceding authority to the executive branch and that... Uh, that one I find, it, and you have uh, subsequent witnesses here who, who have that belief much more strongly than I do. Um, having worked on both ends of the avenue on budget issues uh, with the Reagan administration and with uh, Congress, I, I think it's frankly the other way around, um, that you would, that the executive branch would lose a modicum of power in the balance of things to the Congress if you make uh, appropriation bills uh, less recurrent, uh, more combined, whether it's you know, once every two years you have these end of the year sessions of negotiation. Um, but I think that's why the, the administration has resisted um, efforts by the Congress to have continuing or have permanent continuing resolutions or automatic continuing resolutions so that, that, that you have a crisis of sorts, be it artificial, to create an atmosphere to uh, reach conclusion of these issues. Um, they may well find another form, that is the executive branch. What about the issue of their responsiveness? Uh, of the agencies? Yes. I, mean, I find it hard to believe that, uh, that any agency would stick their finger in appropriator's eye just because it's going to be uh, 18 months before they see him again. Um, you know, I, I just, uh, I don't, I can't imagine that happening. And the, most of the management of the Congress of Agencies goes on year-round. It's not mm -hmm. just in an oversight hearing before an authorizer or appropriator, or even in the appropriation acts itself. I mean, there's ongoing uh, work between the appropriation staff, some of your staff, and agencies. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that, uh, I guess they call it uh, lengthening the leash. I don't see that as being a particularly bad Thank you very much. It's very helpful. Mr. Goss. Thank you very much, Mr. We've covered a lot of ground. You probably are as good a position as anybody with your job to, to judge uh, in, in terms of time and effort of the people who put together budgets, whether there would be really tangible savings if we switched the system now. And, and do you think there, are, there would be tangible savings I in time? I suspect there would be some. Um, again, we are in, in the happy and luxurious position of reacting to budgets, not developing them. So um, whenever this uh, system, however it works, we will be in, in that same mode, presumably. So, uh, but I have uh, worked on budgets uh, in the executive branch and putting them together, and indeed it is a very time-consuming process. It's not to say it's not a useful process, however, as I think the director uh, before me said. But I, I can imagine that it would save some time to not have to go through all of it every year. Well, I'm, I'm certainly not wedded to change for change's sake uh, in any way. I, we're, we're trying to see what the pluses and minuses if you make this sure. kind of a change. And I, I had assumed that time savings would be one of them, and I'm interested in your view on that. The other is that you, you're in a very good position also to make any comment you'd like on the, the authorization question I asked Mr. Lew, which I'm mm -hmm. sure you heard. Uh, I, I am a little puzzled sometimes about uh, why we have seemed to have slipped away from the, the authorization process. I would be curious to know whether you think it's got anything to do with the budgeting process or uh, it's just an anomaly uh, from another direction. I'm not sure I know the cause. Uh, like you and the director, there are different classes and, and therefore different reasons as to why these things happen. In some cases, because it's felt they're not needed. 
Uh, that is, the program will go on, and therefore we shouldn't break our backs uh, reauthorizing. Um, but it is an increasing problem, at least if you measure it, as you were suggesting, by the amount of money that is being appropriated that hasn't been authorized. Uh, that seems to be growing, uh, just as I think, and, and this is a casual observation, not, uh, not analytically derived, I think uh, oversight in general has declined in our authorizing uh, uh, committees. Again, I don't know the, the reason for that, and, and until you know the reason, it's hard to have a solution. Um, you know, if, if it is indeed time, uh, and, and the authorizing committee chairman are uh, more than willing to do oversight, but don't, don't have the time, then indeed a two-year cycle might help that. Um, I suspect there are lots of reasons why oversight has declined. Um, well, I, I'm sure I agree with it. It is there are lots of reasons. I, I think time is a factor in one of my. I other feel one of the aspects of, uh, of oversight is accountability. And uh, sometimes when there's no authorization, accountability gets a little blurred, too. So that, that might be an incentive as well. Well, clearly, these processes were meant to complement each other, um, the authorizers to do both oversight and, of course, the parameters of the policy, and the appropriators to evaluate the appropriate funding levels and set priorities among available dollars. So the, the processes were intended to be fully complementary, and, and I think when they work, they, they are that way, clearly in your case uh, with the intelligence authorization appropriation. I have no objection to uh, uh, an appropriation of an unauthorized amount subject to the authorization of that amount. Uh, that's not the handy way to do it and an, uh, probably not the smartest way to do it because it leaves a lot of uncertainty as you go down the road. And if you're moving numbers around and dollars around, you don't want that uncertainty. But it seems to me even that would be an improvement over the, the non-authorized approach. Would you agree with I, that? I, yeah, I agree. Um, again, I think that, that what we're discussing in some ways are mechanisms by which we can produce not only better decisions, but uh, more efficient decisions in some ways, but also recognize that we need to keep, as uh, Senator Dole was reminding me back in 1981, the ability to have conflict resolution. Um, is there a mechanism that will force you, especially given the thin margins you now have uh, and the differences in parties between the executive and congressional, what mechanisms are there to force conclusions to, to have policy or conflict resolution, either one? And it's not just that you can fully eliminate that. Um, you may have better ways to do it, but it's not uh, possible to completely eliminate those conflicts and the ultimate discussions that need to take place. Thank you very much, Dan. We appreciate yeah. your being here and uh, very helpful. And uh, we're, we're going to have uh, some written sure. questions to submit to you. And appreciate it. you, of course, will continue working with our uh, office. Absolutely. On this, uh, no, and we look forward to forward. it because there are some, obviously, things not only that we're properly interested in, but have some notions about how Absolutely. it might work. Thank you. Hope everything works out well for you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to bring our uh, last two witnesses up together. Sue Irving, the Associate Director of Budget Issues at the General Accounting Office, and Lou Fisher, Senior Specialist in Separation of Powers in the uh, Congressional Research Service. So we uh, welcome both of you, and thank you very much. And you're certainly uh, free to summarize uh, your remarks uh, as you see fit. Ms. Irving. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Goss, Mr. Moakley. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, um, as you all know, I actually like talking about the budget process, and I'm delighted to come back and join another group of uh, slightly nutty individuals. Um, as you noted, I'd like to have my whole statement put in the record. I'd like um, to stand back a minute and remind us that part of why the budget debate is always going to take a long time is because it is through the budget that we resolve the often conflicting demands and views about the role of government by the American people. You all live this world. You know your constituents want a smaller government as long as it fixes all of their problems. Um, someone I worked for once said that all of American political thought could be summed up in two sentences. Get the government off my back and there ought to be a law. Um, and so I think that in a very real way, when you talk about your frustration about how long the debate takes, I think what you're really saying is that you feel that you debate either numbers without context or the same thing over and over again. I know Senator Domenici used to talk about having to fight about whether the space station should be continued first on the budget resolution, then on the authorization bill, and then on the appropriations bill, and that he would feel better if he could only have the argument twice. So I'm not sure, as I said, that I think your issue is that it takes too much time as much as that you feel like it's sort of not appropriately focused. And how can you think about restructuring it to do that? The other thing I'd like to note is that in a very real sense, you stand at a threshold today, not just the hoopla about a new century, 
but having slain, at least for the time being, the deficit dragon, you have the ability to stand back and look at two other very important things. One is how do you think about the long-term costs of the commitment the government makes? We know that the good news is that my generation is getting older, at least for us. The bad news is we're getting older. And that that demographic tidal wave will, in fact, absent policy changes, overwhelm either the surplus or, at a minimum, the flexibility to do anything else in government. And when you're fighting the annual deficit problem, you don't have time to look at that. And now you do. You also, and my predecessors at the table address this, are just beginning to reap the benefits of some far-sighted laws you all enacted, giving them time to bear fruit. The CFO Act, the Government Performance and Results Act, the Klinger Cohen Act. These are now just beginning to bring to all of you some performance and cost information that is being, I think it's fair to say, unevenly done and unevenly used, because it takes time to adjust. These issues confront you whether or not you change the cycle for the budget process. And I think whether you stay in an annual cycle or go to a biennial, you should spend some time thinking about how to use that information in cross-cutting ways. Because I would argue that your current authorization and appropriations committees are quite well suited to do targeted oversight, to do program by program oversight. Um, when Director Liu talked about working very hard to prepare for hearings, I thought to myself, well, that sounds like oversight to me when I have. <laughs> um, but Congress and the executive branch have a harder time doing cross cutting oversight. We have quite appropriately in this government assigned many agencies and used many tools to address the same problems. We use tax, we use spending, we use state grants, we use regulation, and we run them through different committees and different agencies to get at a number of things, everything from counterterrorism to health to I remember Mr. Micah at one point trying to look at trade policy and figuring out that he thought he had 19 subcommittees involved in it. It's not clear how you do that on either cycle at the moment whether you stayed with annual or went to biennial. And certainly, Mr. Walker, in testifying both before the Senate Budget and the House Budget Committees last month, suggested that you all think about whether this means that vis-a-vis -vis oversight, you're in a similar situation to what you were vis-a-vis -vis budget before the Budget Act. Whether you wanted to think about something like a performance resolution as an adjunct to the budget resolution, not with numerical rigid targets that, oh, you didn't feed this many hungry people, we're going to cut your budget, or should we increase it? Um, but things like, should the views and estimates process be modified to have agencies suggest targets for cross-cutting oversight? So just, I wanted to just put in that context, to the extent that you look at biennial budgeting as an attempt to think about better or more systematic oversight, then it won't happen by itself in any process. You have to think about how to structure it, given the fact that there are disparate jurisdictions. Your staff asked me in my focus on biennial today to talk about a couple of things in particular. One is, I think, to remind you, or to remind all of us for the record, that Congress is actually pretty good at giving multi-year money and different timing of money when it thinks it needs it. So that the frequency of decisions is not the same thing as the periodicity of money. All the four of you all know that, but there are certainly people who write about this or think about this or talk about it as though somehow the only way to give the agencies advanced planning ability or flexibility in the use of their funds is to change the cycle. Indeed, all these bills propose two one-year budgets. We're not going to 24-month fiscal years in any of these proposals. The other thing your staff asked me to look at, something that the other witnesses have not looked at, which is the experiences of some of the states. And I'm happy to do that. We are currently looking in depth at three states, and I'll mention them in a minute. Let me add a couple of caveats, of course. State budgets fill a very different role than the federal budget. And state procedures and policies cannot be translated wholesale to the federal government. So I would not want to be heard to suggest that you should make your decision based on the state experiences. Rather that as you think about what it would take to implement this if you chose to do it, that some of the mechanisms they have used should either give you ideas or pause. 
because I think that the one thing that the director, Lou, and I absolutely agree on is in this, the devil will be in the details. How you decide to make it work will mean whether it transfers power, how it works, and what you get from it. The three states of particular interest, I think, are Ohio, Arizona, and Connecticut. Ohio, because it's the only large state that has both an annual legislature and an annual budget process, and it always has. Arizona, because it, just last year, moved its budget to an annual, to a biennial cycle with the avowed intent and a structure for seeking cross-cutting oversight in the even-numbered year. Now, in Arizona, they only appropriate half their money. Federal money flows directly to the agencies, as does, interestingly, any money created by user re voter referendum or any user fees. And Connecticut, because about a decade ago, they went to the idea that biennial would increase oversight and the governor is supposed to propose a budget, a biennial budget, every odd-numbered year, and they're supposed to do um, non-budget substantive reviews in the even-numbered years, except that in the last decade, every even-numbered year, the governor has had a fairly significant number of policy proposals and budget revisions, so that this year in a $10 billion budget, the combination of gross technical changes and gross policy changes, that is both pluses and minuses, just adding all those, has been more than $750 million. So that at least based on our preliminary uh, conversations, they have not in fact done oversight in the second year, except in the context of the appropriations process where they were doing it before. None of these states separate authorizations and appropriations. Most states have one omnibus appropriation bill or a few. In most states, the governor has a great deal more power than the Constitution envisions you give the president. In Ohio, which is the state that seems the only, as I said, the only large state that does this and the state quite satisfied with it, um, there is this thing called a controlling board, which is composed of six members of the legislature and the director of the governor's office of management and budget. This controlling board does not adjust the total level of general revenues. It moves money between years. It moves money between purposes within a single agency. And if you are fee funded, it may approve an increase in your spending if your fees rolled in. Um, the governor also, as you all know, has the power to cut spending unilaterally to achieve a balanced budget. Um, as I said, we have um, more preliminary details on the states if you're interested, and we'll share that with your staff. I think at the federal level, just let me shift to comments that were thoughts I had based on what the previous witnesses said and some of your questions. If you are thinking about the first year of a new president, and I heard a number of people in the dialogue talk about phasing, you might want to look, both as an illustrative possible transition approach, but also as a cautionary tale on how willing your colleagues will be to really do this, at the Defense Committee. Under current law, the Department of Defense is supposed to submit and supposed to receive a biennial authorization and a biennial appropriation. And you all know it does not. They do, however, propose, prepare a biennial appropriation request. And the department goes through the process of doing a biennial budget. In fact, the Defense Department would say that right now they have more burden than they would under an annual process because they have to do the second year twice. But it means you have a department that's ready to go. But you have a Congress that has been unwilling, for whatever reason, to do this. Whether or not you get the benefits on, from a biennial budget process that you seek depends entirely, I think, on what provisions you design for the second year, how you compensate for the fact that you will no longer have a fixed period where the committee, where the agency comes up with money at stake to perform before you, what the bias is about supplementals, whether you pull it off as a single technical revision, how you respond to things that are unexpected. Think about emergencies today, and that's in a one-year period. So I think it's an open question whether you can make it work. And because of that, it may be an open question whether you want to do it. But if you do do it, I think it's going to take a lot of detailed planning.
I'd be happy to answer any questions. And of course, we're available to assist in any way. I want to thank you very much for your test testimony. I, I just have a couple of questions with respect yes. to the states. Do Ohio, Arizona, and Connecticut all meet every year? Yes, they do. Um, Texas does not. Texas has a, that's correct. From your, just your knowledge of Texas, does the executive have broad, expansive powers on the off year? Um, actually, Texas I do not know a lot of detail about because since I've mostly been looking at the states with the idea of what they could offer Congress, I've only looked at the ones that do annual. <coughs> Texas is an interesting state because it is generally viewed as a weak governor state despite having a biennial legislature. Um, but I actually do not know. I could get you that information, sir, and would do something. I once proposed 20 years ago that the Georgia legislature ought to meet in the odd number of years and pass bills and the even number of years and repeal them all. <laughs> it, didn't, um, it didn't meet with I, I know too little about Georgia. Approval. Um, there have been some comments from both Republican and Democrat people that the GAO was getting um, less and less valuable information in some of their studies. I've, I'm sure you've read some of the complaints. Getting less and less, less, and less valuable, Less and less valuable information in some of your studies. And I'm curious to know whether it's getting more and more difficult to get information. Um, Mr. Linder, I think the experience in getting information tends to, to vary widely. Uh, I mean, the kinds of studies I do, frankly, it's not a problem. I mean, OM, both OMB and CBO and the committees have always been very cooperative, and the states have been cooperative, And because I look at budget process. Um, so I'm not sure I'm in a position to make a general comment about that. I know there have been some incidents. I think that most of them have been worked out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and Mr. Walker is generally not the kind of person who takes no for an answer, so I'm not... I don't know that you should be overly worried about their ability, his ability to work these out. He's from my county. I happen to know him. Yes, well, then you um, know what I mean, sir. Let me, uh, let me just go ahead and pass on to Mr. Goss for right now. I uh, don't have a lot of questions. Uh, I, I agree with one of the points you make very strongly about the longer view, and uh, it's something you touched on. Do you, do you have a desire to to share with us a mechanism that works for the longer view process? Well, one, it's interesting. We've, as you probably know, I've, um, we've done some work on looking at how the budget, how the current budget accounts for accrual for insurance programs and long-term commitments. And the problem is that the very long-term data is a little squirrely. Um, but we have proposed that for a number of areas, it would be a good idea to accompany in the budget some supplementary data and to improve the quality of that information. You wouldn't, I would not propose going as far as we do with credit, where we have shifted from cash budgeting to accrual budgeting, because we're not ready yet for insurance and pension programs to do that. But I think we are ready to create the pressure to improve the data by requiring it be included as supplementary information. Um, and that therefore, and then you might think about whether you wanted to go to some sort of triggers within the process where disclosure of, of a, a range of size of the commitment. I mean, I don't think you're ready to integrate it into scoring, but I think it's really important to recognize that PBGC is not a profit center for the government. <laughs> and on a cash basis, it looks like one. Um, I think that's a good observation. I, uh, I'm going to have to go in a few minutes, so I'm going to hold my questions because I'd like to hear what other yeah. witness has to say. Thank you. Yes, I'm serving. Uh, you referred to Ohio as a biennial state, but don't they have the operating budget on one year and the capital budget yes, on the sir. other year? So is it really a biennial well, budget? I mean, you, well, when I make these lists, I, of course, take the state's definition. I would say that Ohio comes closer to being on a staggered biennial cycle than some of the others that list themselves as mixed, like Kansas, which is mixed. But what it means is that the regulatory boards like cosmetology are on biennial and all of the general fund is on annual. But um, yeah, Ohio is on what I'll call it, it's a split schedule. One year they do capital and one year they do operating. And then the off year that they do operating budgets and they have this control board, does that almost take the place of the legislature that they, everything that emanates from the control board that would actually be emanating from the legislature through you know, the budget process? Very, the other thing that is consistent in states is they, give a great deal of power to staff groups 
In some of these states, the equivalent of the Congressional Budget Office actually prepares the appropriation bill. Oh. So they have a joint legislative budget office. Um, and so what happens in Ohio is the governor proposes a budget, their legislative budget office looks at it, analyzes it, their appropriations committees pass um, the appropriations. They're all done pretty fast in these states. Um, during that period, the controlling board may be making adjustments um, on some of the non-appropriated revenues. The controlling board has to approve all contracts over $25,000. I mean, so you know, every time you want to change your cleaning company. Um, but I do not think I do not think I could say that they usurp the power of the appropriators in the odd-numbered year. But if you think of it as the legislature providing, well, well, uh, don't they have the ability to? take money out of one of account put to another account in emergencies? They can move money between purposes within an agency, yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, so would that be the action of the legislature? Oh, yes, I'm just meant, I thought you meant in creating the overall budget in the... No, 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 I mean no. just administering the budget. Yes, sir. Right. They basically run reprogramming transfer... Well, that's one of the things I was trying to show, that by going to this biennial, sometimes you, you, you're putting bureaucrats, unelected officials, do the things that elected officials do today. Well, in Ohio, it's really as if you picked six of your colleagues and gave it to them, because the controlling board is members of the legislature. So it's as if you were willing to It's a great board to be on. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, we have similar in Georgia where a uh, panel of legislators can move money within, mm -hmm. within reprogram money within agencies. Uh, since the 60s, those 17 states that have changed their budget cycles, has, has there been a trend to which direction they go? Well, until this decade, the trend was from biennial to annual. And the explanation generally was that the difficulty in forecasting, that uncertainty, and they were making too many adjustments. Um, in this decade, the only shifts have been um, Arizona to biennial, Connecticut to biennial. That's it, just those two in this decade. If the difficulty in and uh, forecasting is more difficult under a two-year budget cycle than a one-year budget cycle. Yes. What is the propensity to pad budget requests? Well, of course, pad is not a neutral term, <laughs> sir. Um, my, I think if I were a good manager and I were trying to guess what I needed in the second year, I would be inclined to round up because uncertainties have a high are greater. I have no, no, no empirical evidence one way or the other. Um, if you're going to retain fixed dollar caps, of course, in the aggregate, that can't happen. It becomes part of the argument between the executive branch agencies. Uh, you mentioned the capital budgets that Ohio, I believe, has. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and there's been some discussion for a decade around here about moving to two budgets and capitalizing uh, major purchases. Are we at the point where we could easily go to that, or is that a very difficult switch? I think it's both a difficult switch and conceptually very different for the federal government. In the states, first of all, they define capital essentially as infrastructure, roads, buildings, and they fund them by floating bonds. Most of, an awful lot of what we would think of as investment in, this, in the federal level, we don't own. I mean, we give grants to the states to build roads. Um, it's real hard to imagine depreciating something you don't own. Um, and the other thing is that there has, it, one of the really big issues is, are you trying to use your budget to match costs to, to outputs or to show the amount of resources you have committed? And we just, in, you know, accrual and capital budgeting help with matching costs in the, economic sense with output, but they really hide how much of resources you've committed. And in general, and I, we think appropriately, Congress has wanted to accurately show the amount of the resources produced in this country which they have committed. And so we have been fairly strong proponents of upfront budgeting um, for capital, because if you've actually committed to the whole building, you've, re you've committed future resources. You can below the aggregate level, improve your allocation of costs by using funds so that the agency getting the building, you know, has sort of, sort of revolving fund. You can use capital acquisition funds below the level 
to allocate the costs more equally, which I think as you look at more at the Results Act, you may want to do. But for the federal government at the aggregate level, capital budgeting raises a lot of problems. The other thing is an awful lot of people only want to move the expenditures to the capital budget, not it's, uh, no revenues. <laughs> no. Let me just pick up on one last point. Uh, you mentioned the Results Act, and, and your job is to look at these things. Yes, sir. Um, do you think a more uniform rule with respect to how it's viewed by agency heads and oversight committees, such as, first, a fairly carefully thought through mission statement, mm -hmm. and then an examination and reauthorization where they approached their mission or when they went at their mission, it doesn't matter whether they got it all done, are they still on the same mission and we don't get mission creep, which many, many federal agencies wind up doing something totally different than they were started to do. Um, of course, they don't do that all by themselves. That's correct. Um, you know, I'm, I always have trouble with abstract mission statements because if you went to the Department of Agriculture and asked them what their mission is, they would talk about um, agriculture in rural America. And if you look at where they spend their money, they're in the Indian support business. And so I'm not sure, their culture is clearly the, the, what they would describe. It's farmers in rural America. That's not where their money is. Um, so abstract mission statements have always made me a little sort of like, hmm. Um, and I, like Director Liu, I don't think you want to go to one size fits all, but you may want to go to one set of categories. I mean, that you want all of them in some way to get to what is the outcome I'm trying to seek in this program which allows something like a science organization to say, look, in the end, what we're seeking to do is increase knowledge and create the potential for breakthroughs. We're not going to measure ourselves on how many breakthroughs there are in a given year. But yeah, that's the outcome we're in the business of. What are the interim measures or interim goals and how close are we able to link them? I mean, we're all pretty careful, clear that increasing prenatal visits helps with low birth weight. We're less clear on how you increase scientific breakthroughs. Um, and, and I think the other thing, um, you know, cost accounting in the federal government is a real infancy stage. So you're going to be a long way before you can do very clear linking of resources to results in a mechanical way. But I think, I think Director Lewis, to be credited with, with really trying to make this work at the executive branch, and I think it's really great that you guys are trying to really see how to fit it into your process, because it offers you great potential. Joe? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Fisher, welcome. Uh, Dr. Fisher is a senior specialist in separation of powers of the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress. He been, began work with the CRS in 1970 as research director of the House Iran-Contra Committee in 1987, a no normal progression of talents here. Um, his specialties include constitutional law, war powers, budget policy, executive legislation, legislative relations, and judicial congressional relations. He is the author of more than 250 article, articles in law reviews, political science journals, encyclopedias, books, magazines, and newspapers. He's written a textbook in constitutional law as well as eight separate books on the presidency, the Congress, and constitutional law. He's received several awards and honors, including the Aaron B. Wildowski Award for Lifetime Scholarly Achievement in Public Budgeting from the Association for Budgeting and Financial Management. In participating with the Central and East European Law Initiative, he has traveled to Bulgaria, Albania, and Hungary to assist those in nations those nations in writing their constitutions. He has also worked in Russia and Ukraine on constitutional matters as part of a CRS delegations. We welcome you. Thank you. Uh, Sue mentioned the study. She's done on three of the states. One of them is Connecticut. I talked with a person in Connecticut this week who's done budgeting up there for 27 years. And he explained that Connecticut about 10 years ago switched from one-year budgeting to two-year budgeting. And there were several reasons. A big reason was for Connecticut to be able to do performance budgeting. And he says this never happened. And I think that underscores some of the points made here today by witnesses. You could adopt a new policy. You could adopt a new process. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. It depends on what members of Congress want to happen in the future. It's a, it'll be a political decision. It's not a process decision. Uh, my statement looks at whether there'll be a shift of power from Congress to the executive branch, uh, how efficient this biennial budgeting will be for Congress, how efficient for the agencies, and whether there'll be new and better oversight. I think there will be a shift of 
power from Congress to the executive branch. Uh, even proponents of biennial budgeting uh, admit that. How much? It depends always on what good faith there is in the executive branch. Uh, you'll be giving them greater discretion. Director Liu talked about probably under biennial budgeting, executive people will need more discretion so that they could use it wisely and prudently and in good faith, or they could use it bad faith. And one of the things that has concerned me in recent decades, probably the last three decades, is that the executive branch is getting more and more structured of having short-term political appointees and not as many long-term careerists who do have a stake in good faith relations with committees. I think we've all seen in recent decades uh, members in the executive branch having little interest in uh, legal limits or constitutional limits or relations with Congress or relations with committees. So if you're dealing with that, uh, that's going to be a problem for you of catch-up uh, to make sure the abuses uh, don't get out of hand. Let me turn to efficiencies for Congress. First of all, as people have said here this morning, um, you're going to have a new administration, uh, untrained, putting together a two-year budget. Uh, how good will that be? That's one problem. Mr. Liu said that it would be a stretch even to complete that by April, so you're losing a couple of months. Uh, in addition to maybe a late budget for a new president, you've got the problem of how good that two-year budget is. If the estimates are not too good because these are not trained people, uh, you're going to have particular problems two years out. Uh, again, you'll be finding yourself with estimates that were inaccurate, uh, inappropriate, and you'll be doing oversight, but it's not the kind of oversight I think people have in mind for biennial budgeting where you get into programmatic concerns. You'll just be finding uh, what adjustments you can make in the second year, particularly um, because of the poor estimates. Uh, point two, uh, let's say biennial budgeting were and there's a new Congress coming in in 2001. Under this system, the authorization decisions would have already been made this year, and 2001 would be set aside for funding. I, I don't think any process can prevent Congress from doing whatever it wants to in the first year. For example, if biennial budgeting had been in place in 1994 and uh, Republicans take control of Congress, they would be at liberty to do what they did, is to pass as much of the contract with America the first year, which is supposedly the budget year. Uh, point three, just as now, uh, you have reprogramming within accounts, you have money taken from one account to another, you have all these adjustments. Uh, that problem with biennial budgeting will not just be twice as bad, I think it will be more than twice as bad because of the poor estimates for your second year. You'll be spending more time finding out what agencies are doing and using and misusing the discretion they had with uh, relatively poor estimates. Uh, point four. All of this assumes that the economy is going along in a fairly stable matter. If you have a downturn, it doesn't matter what your process says for year one, year two. You'll have to address that and you'll make political decisions as elected officials. Point five, uh, Director Liu suggested that under biennial budgeting, executive branch would want more discretion than they have now. It'll be interesting to see what kind of new uh, adjustments would be made. Maybe the executive branch would like discretion to move money from year one to year two. That would be something to be debated. Another possibility is under reprogramming right now, some of the reprogramming requests come from agencies and it's just for notification to committees and other reprogramming require prior approval. Uh, Congress may decide under biennial budgeting that they want to move a lot of the things of notification into prior approval. Um, next point, if we have statutory caps and you have to live within limits, and if some programs, because of poor estimates, are climbing beyond the limit, you have to find money somewhere else. And it may be the case that if a program is climbing, that you can't find just one account to take money from. You may have to take money from two or three accounts to uh, replenish the uh, 
headcount that's that's growing. So you're going to have a lot of shifting of money and changing of account levels. We mentioned the National Performance Review. They criticize annual budgeting because there's padding. I think under biennial budgeting, you would expect more padding. Uh, what are the choices for Congress? You could decide on biennial budgeting to fund agencies at a minimal level and force them to come back for supplementals. That will maximize uh, congressional control. It will also maximize congressional work. The other choice uh, to uh, give agencies ample funding to get through the two years, uh, uh, the downside on that is that you'll be giving um, uh, greater discretion, control, and power to the executive branch. Oh, we haven't talked about tax bills. I don't know. I guess those would happen a lot in the first year where you're doing all your budgeting work. But if you wanted to do tax bills the second year, I think you would do it, just as you did this year with the uh, marriage tax penalty bill. I don't think you can compartmentalize things in year one, year two. Uh, you'll make political decisions, which is what you're supposed to do. Uh, what about the possibility that the two-year budget wouldn't pass the first year? We have a hard time now passing it. I think a two-year budget would be more contentious, uh, a lot more difficult to get a consensus. Uh, if uh, When a new president comes in, instead of the budget coming up in early February, we come up in early April. You've already lost two months there under this process. And I think there's general agreement that the reason you finish your budget now in, in the first year, if you, even if it goes into October, November, is that you know in the next early February you got another budget coming. How about if there's no budget coming the next year? Uh, will you be losing the incentive to finish up? Will that debate on the two-year budget in year one go into the next year? Let me turn to efficiencies for agencies. Uh, I don't know. I don't think anyone would know what agencies are going to do under biennial budgeting. They know from what I just said that you may have to take money from accounts uh, because another account is climbing. Uh, will, would they want to prematurely obligate money uh, to lock it up uh, so you can't get at it? I don't know what the psychology is in, in agencies. I think there's a lot of uh, be more uncertainty in agencies with two-year budgeting, because everyone knows that the estimates are off and money is going to be moving around. I don't know how agencies will behave. There's a thought that there'll be more long-term planning in agencies. Maybe there will. I don't think it will be that uh, marked. Um, agencies will still have to come up every year when you do your oversight on year two. Uh, OMB will be watching agencies very, very carefully. I think any notion that there's going to be uh, expansive planning down the road is probably not going to uh, happen. I mentioned the problem of short-term political appointees. They're in for 18 months, maybe in for 24 years. Many of them have not been in government before. They have no idea about your prerogatives in Congress. They really don't care about it. Uh, they do a fair amount of damage, they leave, they go back to the private sector, and you have to, you have to uh, clean up the mess. I think we're losing agency careers. That's part of the reinvention that happened in 1993. A lot of long-term uh, careers are out of government. Uh, I don't see any uh, move to uh, uh, put them back in. So you are depending more and more on short-term political appointees. Uh, last point under this, the National Performance Review criticized annual budgeting because it says you have to look out two years for uh, obligations and three years for outlays. You know, that's a problem. Biennial budgeting will make it a year uh, worse. You'll have to look out three years for VA and f four years for outlays. Congressional oversight, I think you'll do more oversight. I don't know what the nature of it will be, whether it will be trying to bird dog the agencies to see what they're doing with this discretion, uh, or whether it will be looking uh, ground up at programs and deciding whether you want to keep them or, or radically change them. 
what will be the change within Congress? Um, most of your authorization committees now do multi-year authorizations. Uh, things won't change for them. That's what they've been doing for a long time. You have two committees that uh, do annual authorizations, the Intelligence Committees and the Armed Services Committees. Uh, there would be a savings there if you went to two-year authorizations. I think in the military area, that's probably the toughest area if you want to go to two-year authorizations. Uh, it's the toughest area in terms of new military commitments and everything else. I, I look at the Armed Services and Intelligence Committees and sort of say, if you give them a score of 10 for their annual authorization year one and give them a score of 10, the annual authorization for year two, and then go to biennial budgeting and give them a score of 10 for their two-year authorization, would they get a 10 for the oversight they do the second year? Uh, first of all, the second year is not must legislation. You heard Mr. Goss how much pressure he is under to complete that. Uh, oversight is going to be a little different the second year, and the second year is when members are running for re-election. I don't know what the priorities will be. It will depend on party leaders, but I don't think you're guaranteed more oversight under this than a uh, system, two-year budgeting, than you get at the present time. It's also likely that under two-year budgeting and, and year two, where you're supposed to do oversight, and year one, where you're supposed to do your authorization bills. I think armed services and intelligence committees, if they had this, would feel free in year two to pass whatever authorizations they thought were necessary, not the, not the large authorization that they do in year one, but some authorization to address uh, emerging issues. You'd lose a little bit of oversight this way, the kind of oversight you get every year from the appropriations subcommittees, and that's oversight with a lot of teeth, with a lot of leverage, uh, a lot of sanctions. Um, fr from all this, I, I can't tell you what's going to happen. I don't think anyone can tell you what's happened. I, I, in 1994, in 1996, you passed the Line Item Veto Act, and it was declared unconstitutional two years later. Uh, so we're back to the process we had. Um, it didn't affect too many agencies. It didn't affect too many committees. Biennial budgeting will affect everything. It'll be a very dramatic change, a very deep change. Uh, you may want to do it. You may want to decide to try it incrementally in some areas. If there are some programs, some agencies that have enough stability you're comfortable with, uh, learn a little bit from that. Maybe, maybe get the Appropriations Committees, CBO, GAO, to make some su suggestions where it might uh, work best uh, uh, starting out on a pilot basis. Those are my comments. Thank you. Well, Mr. Fisher, you seem to have spent a career looking deeply into the in the workings of our government deciding it doesn't work. <laughs> it has been I'm here for 30 years. I love it. This is the greatest <laughs> job you could have. Um, have you ever given thought to this, whether we should get rid of either the authorizing or the appropriating committees? I've given thought to it. And if, um, I think authorization committees, these are the committees that create programs. I don't know how you get rid of programs, uh, uh, committees like that. Well, they, they provide the authority for spending. Why don't they just spend? Oh, you could. We, we've gone through periods where you had a committee that does both authorization and appropriation. We've gone back and forth over our history. Uh, the, the, the new uh, one on the block, of course, is the Budget Committee. That's um, the third layer. Um, to me, you have to do authorization. You have to do appropriation. You could combine them. Um, there's a thought as to how much we need uh, budget resolutions every year, particularly if it's interfering with the work of the appropriation committees and getting started. But we have three layers. I think there's good thought that could be on what can we do to at least go to two layers. I'm interested in your comment about losing talent because of the reinventing government proposals. Specifically, uh, what changes were made in policy that caused career professionals to decide it wasn't worth staying? Well, I think the, the policy was to get rid of close to 300,000 federal employees. Most of those were in the military. A lot were in the military. Um, 
one of the interesting changes it's not as though government is smaller as a result of three hundred thousand people we simply contract out a lot of things that agencies used to do and that's a concern to me where you have people in the private sector doing things that agencies used to do with accountability to congress um, you made two or three comments and you've written about the short-term political pointing to being less attentive to constitutional restraints than career professionals. Do you have any uh, evidence to back that up? Oh, I only a lot of anecdotal evidence, a lot of stories. I've written about it at times. Uh, it happens. I think it's natural that people coming in from the private sector, they just don't understand constitutional limits or even statutory limits or prerogatives of committees and they prerogative is uh, their priority is to get something done for the president who put him in place I, I tend to agree with your assessment I'm just wondering if you had any empirical information on that I've never seen anything in a really sophisticated statistical way but uh, we have a lot of uh, problems of this nature and I think you have less problems with careerists who are here and they know they have to come back over a long period of time and and deal in good faith with committees. In your prepared statement, you talked about agency heads being very nervous about losing funding in the second year. Why is that any different than today? Oh, it's not any different. I think it's different probably because the second year, the estimates aren't going to be as good and people don't know what's going to happen. Uh, they'll do it both years. They, I would think they would do it a little bit more the second year. Um, if tax bills are going to be introduced in any event in year two, uh, I think the only Department of Government that thinks those tax bills are spending bills, if they're tax cuts, uh, how, why would this have an impact on our spending budget? Not on spending, but if you think of the budget on both sides, um, I, I'm not sure myself. I assume that uh, anything of a revenue n nature would be done the first year when you're trying to decide what your budget is. Whether it's income or outgo. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm thinking that even if you try to do it all in year one, there'll be occasion where Congress will decide they want to pass tax legislation in year two. Uh, have you looked at the performance budgeting of New Zealand over the last decade or so? I, I have not. We're going to have some testimony from a gentleman who was in their parliament at the time. It was pretty interesting because his point is going to be to, they paid attention to the oversight and it gave the control of the legislative branch, or gave much more control of the legislative branch over the spending side of the, of the issue. Mm -hmm. It might That's be interesting. interesting in his testimony. Mr. Mookley? Well, I just wish the whole committee were here to hear your side of the story. I, I agree with most all of it. Uh, and I know that many people really think by going bicentennial, you've got to cure all the budget problems, but it's really not. I mean, you're still going to have the problems and they're just going to be stretched out a little bit. And I'm afraid that the executive gets too much power out of this. And I'm afraid the bureaucrats will end up making decisions that the Congress should make themselves. Uh, and uh, I would think that, uh, if anything, probably much more study should go into whether we go bicentennial. And I think you can't look at a state because it's gone bicentennial and figure, hey, they do it, so we should do it. I mean, they don't have to raise money for the military. They don't have to do a lot of things we have to do. Uh, and as Mr. Irving said, you know, when they go into their capital budget, they, you know, float bonds. I mean, we, we pay out of gas tax or something else on some of the roads. So I think that the United States is probably unique in its budget. And I think to use lesser countries that have just such a small percentage of our overall budget and a small percent of our duties would really be just a, an exercise in, uh, you know, futility. I don't think it would solve anything. So I, I welcome you anytime, and I, I'm very happy you're here. And as I said, I only wish the rest of the committee were here to hear your view. I wish I knew more why members of Congress uh, coming to the point of warning uh, biennial budgeting. Uh, I'm not in their shoes. I don't know how awful it is to schedule things on the floor and get it through and what the end of the year looks like. But I think it's, I think 
because somewhere in their mind they feel that this is going to cure a lot of the problems. But a lot of the problems of policy differences is not budget differences, I think. And especially when you have a, such a small minority and, and split between minority and majority, many of those problems are, get exacerbated because there are only a few votes separating one side from the other, and therefore the fights get heavier and, and probably more dramatic. Uh, but I, I just don't think there's no magic wand out there. And as far as oversight, I think much of the oversight, on our, some of the oversight is overlooked because it's not as sexy as going out and plowing new fields and, 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 and bringing new programs on and finding other solutions uh, to certain problems out there. Oversight is like going over the old stuff and it's, you know, we've done it. We've been there, done that, you know. So I just think that oversight doesn't necessarily get addressed when people have more time that they may save by having this bicentennial budget. Just like you say in Connecticut, they changed it for a purpose and they never addressed the purpose. I think that probably very well could happen here. I think, Mr. Merkel and I differ on one point, and that is, I think the sense of those who are supportive of the buying and budgeting is that it consumes not only on the floor, um, but in our processes, it consumes an unbelievable amount of our time. And it is policy driven, and it is battles over uh, between the House and Senate. But uh, there's a growing number of us who just believe that we haven't had the time and taken the time to do the appropriate oversight. And I asked Mr. Liu if they viewed our oversight as helpful or hurtful. Uh, I would like to think that we could get involved in oversight activities that the administration would welcome uh, and not just be digging up dirt on, on other things. We just haven't done that. And I think there's a sense that we would do more of it and more constructively if, uh, if we had a biennial budget. But what has happened in recent years to put us in the position of maybe wanting to go to biennial budgeting because for more than two centuries, Congress every year has been able to do the budget work and I would think that that's about as important a uh, function uh, elected official can have, budgeting. So well, I don't think it's clear what, what has happened that suddenly makes it difficult to do every year. Something obviously has happened. It's Actually, not clear to me. Number one, it's, it's been around for some time being kicked around here. It's, it's an old idea that's taken a long time to get people to come to. But number two, I think Ms. Irving ref referred to the states having a different role in the federal government because when I was in the legislature, that was the job, was to pass a budget. I mean, virtually that's what we did and then picked up one or two policy issues that were large that the governor was proposing that year that had to do with how the money was going to be spent anyway. But here we have many other things to be concerned about uh, in the military and the in the uh, HHS uh, policy decisions, and we're not paying the kind of attention to those we think that we mm -hmm. ought to be. Good. Yeah. Oversight, not gotcha oversight, but you know what you call constructive oversight, is really hard work. Yeah. And yeah. and it involves re-examining your base. I mean, at one point, I you know every year some universities put out a thing to their faculty saying the students entering today as freshmen were born in X. They have never, they don't know what a record player is. They've never seen a dial telephone. They've always had computers in their lives and aids in their lives. They don't know what beta is. They can't imagine anyone didn't have a VHS. Mm -hmm. You know, they go through all these lists of things. They don't know who Ronald Reagan was, much less that he was shot. The programs in existence, many were created not only before that child was born, but before his parents were married. Um, so you need to re-examine your base and think about what government you know, is doing and how. I guess the question you really have to ask you is, is what's stopping you the annual budget fight? And what is it about a shift to biennial appropriations that will make it more likely or more successful to do that kind of oversight? Um, how do you do cross-cutting oversight? And is what's really stopping you the annual process or is it the fact that you fundamentally disagree, or the, and the American people disagree. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, until 1995, we had a national helium reserve. Yes. Started in 1929 to make sure we'd have heliums for our dirigibles in the next war. Uh, in 1993 and 1994, the first two years I was here, that became a fight on a, an amendment on appropriations bill. Mm -hmm. And the majority wanting to pass the bill 
had to stand in lockstep against cutting this program for fear it would lose adherence. All of these programs develop their own constituencies. And rather than having that fight on appropriations bill, it seems to me some honest public discussion of the issue could have brought two sides together on it and some other policy environment than on the floor on an appropriations bill. Uh, every one of these programs develops their own constituency. It was Ronald Reagan who said the closest thing to perpetual life is the government program. Uh, and we have programs throughout that either Joe or I could cut if you gave us each the wand. Mm. They'd be probably different. But we, if we sat down and talked about it, we could realize together that some of these programs just aren't serving useful purpose anymore. But when it comes down to the debate on the program being a amendment on appropriations bill, it doesn't get the same kind of attention it would in another setting. Mr. Chairman, may at this time just make a question. I really extended the budget term to bicentennial. I meant biennial, yeah. but I said bicentennial. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something would be quite be dramatic, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, Joe, at your age, we'll forgive anything. Yeah. I, I think that you might, the, one of the things that Lou mentioned, I think, is something that's important. When, when the bills in biennial budgeting assume you have to move everything, we're going to move the budget resolution, we're going to move authorizations, we're going to move the president's budget, we're going to you know, I haven't looked at this really closely, but you could, multi-year authorizations are the norm. I have looked yes. at that. You could argue that given that you have had multi-year fiscal policy agreements, that the difference that you could, if you could figure out a way to adjust for changing economics and revenue estimates, go to multi-year biennial budget resolutions and still keep, as Lou mentioned, and still keep, you know, your annual appropriations cycle. And it does that in one year. I mean, to the extent that the appropriations process is delayed because of waiting for the budget resolution. Now, you need an adjustment ability in there, especially given what's been happening to revenue estimates lately. But I guess I think it's that you don't have to do the same thing for every thing. And that's the other way to think of phasing if you're trying to experiment. It'd be whether you move some things but not everything. Thank you both. Would you each be willing to receive written requests for more information? We well, thank you for your time. I uh, thank you very much. Very, very useful. Thank you. Thank you. discussion on First Amendment rights with author Amit